Lucifer Moon's Lightbringer presents The Mythical Astronomy of Ice and Fire The Weirwood Goddess Part 1 Venus of the Woods Hey there, friends, patrons, and fellow mythical astronomers. It's your starry host, Lucifer Means Lightbringer, back with a new series, The Weirwood Goddess, and new theme music to match. That lovely guitar playing that you just heard is from Mr. John Walsh, a renowned flamenco guitarist from Ireland, who was kind enough to whip this up for our podcast. You can check out more of John's playing on his YouTube channel, which is appropriately titled John Walsh Guitar. Now, I love animals as leaders, and even though they had given me permission to use their stuff, YouTube was flagging every video with their music, and the process of clearing it up was getting pretty annoying. I learned that I had a talented guitarista as a podcast listener, so here you go. We now have original, non-copyrighted theme music of our very own. Thanks, John. As for the new series, well, it sort of grew out of the Weirwood Compendium series that we were working on. I started with a small section about Nissa Nissa's overlap with the Weirwoods, and it grew to a large section, and then into its own essay, and now it's a whole series. We were long overdue for some gender equality and goddess worship, and the Weirwood Compendium research based on the ash tree has taken us here. So now I present to you what I think is one of the most important writings that I've done so far, Weirwood Goddess One, Venus of the Woods. I want to get right to it, so let me quickly but enthusiastically thank Mr. Martin Lewis for his stellar-as-usual vocal performances, which add so much to the podcast by bringing the text to life. Today, for the female readings, we have the return of Lady Nightwind of the Lucifer's Handmaidens, so thanks to her as well. Many thanks. And, of course, many thanks to Mr. George R. R. Martin for enthralling us all with his world of ice and fire. I'd also like to blow the Herald's trumpet in salute of our two new Guardian of the Galaxy patrons, Lady Diana, the Ghost Huntress, Pursuer of Truth and Guardian of the King's Crown, which is the cradle north of the Wall, and our former House Cancer Zodiac patron, Lady Jane of House Celtigar, the Emerald of the Evening and Captain of the Dreadship Eclipse Wind, who is now the Guardian of the Crone's Lantern. You can still claim any of the other non-Zodiac constellations, such as the Galley, the Horned Lord, the Ice Dragon, the Moon Maid, and a few others, by going over to LuciferMeansLightbringer.com and clicking the Patreon link at the top. And we will be eternally grateful for your support. LuciferMeansLightbringer.com is also where you can find the matching text to this podcast, as well as some great artwork by some of the talented artists in the fandom. All right. In the last episode, we saw that our friendly author, Mr. George R. R. Martin, appears to be using the symbolism of Yggdrasil as an ash tree to great effect mostly pertaining to the ideas of the weirwoods as symbolic burning trees, which enable transcendence of death. We talked about the location of the meteor impact as a kind of ground zero for Lightbringer's forging and Azorahai's rebirth, and how the rising ash symbol found there doubles as a depiction of an ash tree rising from the impact zone. This symbolic ash tree in the ground zero pyre is a reference to the ash tree Yggdrasil, and thus to the weirwoods. This line of ash tree symbolism stacks on top of a separate line of burning weirwood symbolism that also exists at these Ground Zero Lightbringer bonfires, such as the burning sea dragon gods, the literal burning tree that Arya sees in the holdfast near the god's eye, or the logs with secret hearts touched by fire at Danny's alchemical wedding, and many more. Both lines of weirwood symbolism at Ground Zero are preceded by the ironborn legend of the storm god's thunderbolt setting the tree ablaze, which seems to place a weirwood symbol, the burning tree, at the site of a meteor impact, the place where the thunderbolt landed. The sea dragon legend does the same thing. The part about a slain sea dragon that could drown whole islands is almost certainly referring to a dragon meteor, which caused tidal waves, but the ribcage of the sea dragon, called the bones of Naga, seem to be made of petrified weirwood. Grey King seems to have sat in a weirwood throne of some kind amidst these weirwood bones, and for that reason and several others, was probably a green seer. Both of these ironborn myths conflate meteor impacts and weirwood symbolism, and both specifically involve the Grey King acquiring some kind of divine fire, the fire of the gods. This is, of course, the primary theme which unites the flaming sword, lightbringer ideas, and the burning tree, weirwood ideas. 
mankind acquiring the fire of the gods. Now, what is all this weirwood symbolism doing at the site of the meteor impacts? Well, that's the question that we're working on answering piece by piece. The first thing we figured out was that it has to do with Azor High being some kind of green seer who undergoes a death and rebirth transformation experience, and that this likely involves both moon meteors and weirwoods, though we haven't figured out exactly how that works yet. The next big piece of the puzzle in regards to the weirwood symbolism found at the Lightbringer bonfires was the discovery of the correlation between the weirwood trees and the moon because of the fiery womb role that they both play. They both get impregnated and wed by Azora High, and both give birth to some kind of reborn Azora High. Even setting aside the issue of Azora High, the Green Seer Weirwood relationship functions this way. The Weirwood is the host, and the Green Seer is the invader. The Green Seer sacrifices his body to the tree, either by allowing it to slowly consume his flesh as Blood Raven is being consumed by the trees or by our hypothesized scenario where the first seers to enter a weirwood were actually killed in order to go inside it, with the heart tree drinking and tasting the blood as Bran does in his last vision through Winterfell's heart tree in A Dance with Dragons. The green seer allows himself to be consumed by the tree, but in doing so actually invades the tree's consciousness and becomes reborn inside the weirwood net, a part of the godhood. The green seer, in general, represents the fire animating the weirwood and the heart in the heart tree, but he essentially has to die to get in there. The symbol that best depicts this is that of the ember in the ashes. Mel compares Azor Ahai's rebirth to an ember in the ashes, which can spark a great blaze like a kind of hell phoenix. However, the idea of Azor Ahai lurking inside the ashes turned out to also be a play on the fact that Yggdrasil is an ash tree thus implying Azor Ahai as being inside the symbolic ash tree, which is the weirwood net. He's the ember in the ashes and the ember in the ash tree, just as the green seer is the fire or heart in the heart tree. Melisandre's wording is also suggestive of Azor Ahai being reborn from the ash tree and emerging to start a great fire, completing the in-and-out-again journey of Azor Ahai and the weirwood net. He seems to undergo death transformation to get in, as Odin was hung on Yggdrasil, and is then born again when he re-emerges, as Odin fell from the tree after hanging in a trance for nine days, and then finally spying and seizing up the runes. Thus, you can see that the Weirwoods and Yggdrasil both play the role of a tree tomb and womb, which allows sorcerers to transcend death and experience some sort of magical rebirth. And this tree womb idea will be the focus of today's episode. Yggdrasil isn't only a vehicle for Odin's rebirth, the idea of Old Iggy as a more literal tree womb is actually a prominent part of its lore as it happens. The only two people who survived Ragnarok did so by hiding inside Yggdrasil's trunk, then re-emerging after a time to restart civilization. From tree tomb to tree womb. This would seem to correlate well to our ideas about green seers being reborn through the weirwood net, since the mythical ash tree is both eating people and acting as a womb from which people can be reborn. In a more general sense, it also seems similar to the idea of the children of the forest and their green seer magic being needed to ensure the survival of humanity after the Long Night. The Long Night borrows a lot from Ragnarok as a catastrophic event that ends one world age and gives birth to the next, so to the extent that the green seers preserved that flame of life to take root again in the spring, they are playing the same protective womb role for humanity. Plus, they might have literally hid the first men in their caves for a more literal depiction of this theme. Now, it turns out that this tree womb and tree woman stuff in relation to the ash tree is not limited to Yggdrasil and Norse myth. Rather, I have found that the tree lore that has grown up around the ash tree is pretty amazing and goes well beyond its identity as Odin's cosmic world tree. For example, according to Celtic Druid traditions, the ash tree is seen as the world mother tree, the feminine counterpart to the masculine oak tree, the all-father tree. This has a lot to do with the bark of the two trees. Oak tree bark is heavily gnarled and ridged, while ash trees are comparatively smooth. The title of this essay, Venus of the Woods, is one of the well-known names given to the ash tree. It's hard to determine exactly why this is so, apart from its general beauty and smooth bark, but the best answer I can find is that because the ash tree is the last to get its leaves in the spring and the first to drop them in the fall, it's often naked. Naked and tall and beautiful, like a Venus. I myself wonder if it might have something to do with one of its more distinctive features, 
The tips of the ash tree branches always curl up at the end, no matter how low the rest of the branch might droop. So, like Venus, there is a distinct falling and rising action. Whatever the reason, the ash tree as a Venus sure fits well with the idea of the weirwood as a burning tree that is created when a falling even star lands on it. It sure jumped off the page at me when I read it, I can tell you that much. Our theory holds that the Nissa Nissa moon turns from moon maiden to falling even star after it ingests the comet, and back to morning star again when she rises from the ashes. This rising ash creates the image of the ash tree, the Venus of the woods. And that's just the point of this episode. The tree in the pyre is in many ways synonymous with Nissa Nissa, the fallen and reborn Venus. One of our Guardian of the Galaxy patrons and Westeros.org chat buddies gets a large hat tip here, and that would be the aforementioned Lady Jane of House Celtigar, the Emerald of the Evening and Captain of the Dreadship Eclipse Wind, Guardian of the Crone's Lantern. She brought the following to my attention, and an additional hat tip to Unchained for reminding me about this after I had forgotten about Lady Jane's original hat tip a couple months earlier. So, in Greek mythology, there's a variety of tree nymph called the Meliae, or Meliae, who are tied to ash trees. They're essentially like dryads, like a spirit of the ash tree. They supposedly gave birth to one of the older races of man, the Bronze Generation, who were a warlike people that the Meliae tree nymphs armed with spears of ash wood from their own ash trees. The Meliae also nurtured their bronze children with honey from their trees, and elsewhere it was some Meliae who nurtured Zeus on the same nectar when he was an infant. As it happens, the origin tale of the Meliae actually overlaps with that of Aphrodite, also known as Venus, she who was born in the sea foam from the severed testicles of Oronos, a legend we discussed at the beginning of Weirwood Compendium 3, Garth of the Gallows. It turns out that while the seed from Ornos created Aphrodite, the blood from his castration wound created a few other beings, among them the Meliae. It's not hard to see how this might translate into a song of ice and fire. The falling blood of a wounded god would be our reign of moon blood and bleeding stars, which were the pieces of the slain moon goddess. And instead of that blood giving birth to tree nymphs, it created the burning tree. What we are going to see here today is that the burning tree and Nissa Nissa have an awful lot of overlap, so it's pretty great to know that there is a precedent for divine blood falling from the heavens and giving rise to magical ash tree women. The ash tree has specific associations with burning. It's most likely that its name was chosen in part because it makes for such excellent firewood. It's able to burn as soon as it is cut down, even while still green, and the resulting flame is bright and hot. The traditional Yule log was supposed to be of ash wood, and as it happens, one of Odin's many names is Yule Father. Odin was one with his ash tree Yggdrasil, so that kind of all makes sense. We also need to consider the rowan tree, because rowan trees are also known as mountain ash. Although they are actually not related to the ash tree, they just look somewhat similar, and so are both called ash. Martin has made specific reference to both rowan trees and a mountain ash trees in the story, and, as you will see, it would appear that he is incorporating some of the folklore around these trees as well. The rowan is widely known in Europe as the witch tree, for several reasons having to do with supposed magical properties, and the fact that its red berries appear to have a five-pointed star, like a pentacle, on their underside. Rowan trees and ash trees are both among the top choices for magical wands, and were thought to convey magical protection, and that sort of thing. Ashwood in particular was the choice for making rune staffs in Norse mythology, and that's almost certainly why J.R.R. Tolkien chose to make Gandalf's staff one of Ashwood. Fun fact. And, lest I fall down on my job, I should point out that the five-pointed stars on the red rowan berries also suggest red stars in the canopy of the world ash tree. The red, five-pointed weirwood leaves serve much the same purpose. We are going to explore some of this tree folklore a bit further as we go along, but already you can see some of the pieces we are working with in the ash and the rowan. A Venus of the woods tree and a witch tree. Rune staffs and red star fruit. Ash trees that give birth to humans, and ash trees that are tied to tree nymphs who dole out ashwood spears. And did I mention that the druids were said to have burned rowan branches before battle to invoke the aid of the she? And when I say she, it's that word that looks like sidhi, and it's actually pronounced she. And that's significant because George has referred to the others as a kind of icy she. 
We already suspect that the others are tied to the weirwoods, the symbolic burning ash trees, so we'll have to follow up on that. With that short introduction into the relevant tree lore out of the way, let's dig into some Song of Ice and Fire and watch Moon Maidens turn into weirwoods before our very eyes. A Tree Cat This section is brought to you by Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Black Rune, sworn alesmith to House Stark, Grand Master of the Zithomancer's Guild, Keeper of the Buzz, and Earthly Avatar of Heavenly House Sagittarius. So, is Nissa Nissa a weirwood tree? Well, yes, and no. They do seem to correlate to each other, just as Nissa Nissa correlates to the moon. However, I think Nissa Nissa does kind of have to be a real woman in some sense, because reproduction is probably the most important manifestation of this entire business about cycles and transformations. And Azor Ahai can't really pass on his magical genetics to anyone unless he reproduces with Nissa Nissa. So she's definitely a woman on some level. But like Nissa Nissa, and like the moon which gave birth to dragons, the weirwood tree also seems to play the role of a fiery womb which gives birth to Azor Ahai Reborn, as I've been saying. Before you can give birth to Azor Ahai Reborn, you have to wed Azor Ahai, and that is indeed the case with the moon, which was wed by the sun, and with Nissa Nissa, supposedly the wife of Azor Ahai, and it's also the case with the weirwoods, wed by Azor Ahai when he theoretically became a green seer. That's the kind of thing which is probably not a coincidence. Then there is the fact that most of our prominent Nissa Nissa moon maidens in the story, well, they sort of look like weirwoods to some degree, with pale skin and red kissed by fire hair. Namely, Melisandre, Lady Catelyn, Sansa, Ygritte, Daenerys when her hair catches on fire, and a few other minor characters. A heart tree's leaves are like its hair, and the red leaves of the weirwoods are described as a blaze of flame, so Nissa Nissa moon maidens with red kissed by fire hair are already off to a good start looking like a weirwood. And then Martin seems to contrive ways for them to acquire the symbolism of bloody hands, bloody or red eyes or tears, and a bloody mouth, just like a weirwood tree. These weirwood makeovers will, of course, take place in the middle of a Lightbringer forging scene, as you might expect. In particular, they will happen in scenes where people are usually attacking these weirwood moon maidens with Lightbringer weapons in a recreation of the comet hitting the moon, the thunderbolt hitting the tree, and the green seer going into the weirwood. All right, so you remember that movie Stigmata? The movie isn't important, it's the concept. The stigmata is when someone, usually a Christian believer, manifests the wounds of Christ, the nail marks in the hands and feet, the wound in the side, and the cuts on the brow from the crown of thorns. These weirwood makeovers are kind of like the stigmata. Our Nissa Nissa moon maidens seem to manifest the signature wounds of the heart tree while being symbolically stabbed or impregnated by a comet or lightbringer symbol. We will check out some great ones today and save a couple others for the future after we have introduced the next concept. It's pretty startling how consistent it is, really. Once you notice the pattern, it really stands out. Accepting Daenerys, who we will be setting aside until the next episode, Lady Catelyn and Melisandre seem to be the two best and most detailed examples of a Nissa Nissa moon maiden manifesting this weirwood stigmata, so we'll be spending the most time with them. First comes Lady Catelyn. She has two scenes that work together, the cat's paw assassin's attempted murder of Bran and the Red Wedding, and these two scenes together lay out the complete set of weirwood moon maiden symbolism. We'll also wave a quick hello to Lady Stoneheart, since she is so fond of hanging people, and since her character is basically a continuation or reverberation of the Red Wedding. The cat's paw scene starts with the cat's paw assassin himself, who is a great symbol that we will see repeatedly in almost all of the various scenes that we examine today. The cat's paw assassin was sent by Joffrey, a solar character, so his cat's paw nickname is actually an identification of his symbolic role. He's acting as the paw and claw of the sun, as the sun's weapon or executioner. That's pretty easy to identify as the comet which struck the moon, which can also be thought of as the sun's sword or the sun's long claw. Now, we've talked a few times about the idea of the original comet being not red, but a more natural white and silver like normal comets. Perhaps suggested by the description of Lightbringer being white-hot and smoking before stabbing Nissa Nissa 
and then turning red thereafter. The cat's paw assassin seems to fit this description, being described as gaunt, with limp blonde hair and pale eyes, deep sunk in a bony face. His knife, however, is dark valerian steel with a black dragonbone hilt. That's very like a black comet core with a white tail, exactly how regular comets look, with the dragon associations of the hilt and the steel, making this an especially terrific symbol of a dragon comet. Ghost and John combine to form a similar image as they rush the Weirwood Grove. John is a black sword with a white shadow at his side, as Ghost is called in that scene. John's spirit inside Ghost is more of the same, a black sword brother inside a streaking white shadow. John's sword long claw shows us a similar pattern with a black blade and a white wolf head pommel. Returning to the cat's paw assassin, we see that he's also remarked upon as being a stranger at Winterfell, and the stranger of the Faith of the Seven is known as the Wanderer from Far Places, which I've always thought of as a perfect description of a comet, a wandering star from far places. The assassin is a stranger with a dragon-tipped claw sent by the sun to kill. That would seem to be the comet. John too is called a stranger and has stranger symbolism, and he too is a comet person in many scenes. In Weirwood Compendium 4, In a Grove of Ash, I asserted that comets and meteors that penetrate moons and trees are symbolic of skin changers and green seers who insert their spirits into trees and animals. The cat's paw should therefore show us skin changer symbolism as well, and here's what we find. He slept in the stables with the horses, and reeks of the stables, and we know that Yggdrasil can be a horse. His horsey smell and origin from the stables also make him a kind of horse comet, and we know that the Dothraki interprets stars and comets as fiery horses, so that's a pretty good fit for both skin changing and comet implications. The folks at Winterfell also found 90 silver stags in a leather bag buried beneath the straw, where the assassin was hiding, which sounds like sacrificed stagman symbolism. The stags are buried in a leather sack, meaning inside a skin, and buried like a dead body, reinforcing the sacrificed stagman symbolism. One thinks of the hanged men outside the Inn of the Crossroads, a.k.a. the Gallows Inn, a.k.a. the inn that symbolizes a weirwood, and we think of the young innkeep Jane Heddle demanding a sacrifice of silver stags to get into the inn. We're actually going to return to that inn in a bit for a weirwood makeover, as a matter of fact, but the point is that stags or green men must be sacrificed to enter the weirwood. It's almost as if the buried sack of stags is like the sacrificed body of the skin changer, and the assassin is like his spirit, going into the trees. Lady Catelyn is, of course, the Nissa Nissa figure and the weirwood figure here. As Cat sees the assassin and turns to the window to scream for help, we see her acquire two main parts of the weirwood makeover in quick succession, the bloody hands and the bloody mouth. We're also going to see the important cannibalism symbolism, which I would say alludes to the weirwoods consuming the bodies and spirits of the green seers strung up in the roots, and also to the general practice of human sacrifice to the weirwood trees. She reached up with both hands and grabbed the blade with all her strength, pulling it away from her throat. She heard him cursing into her ear. Her fingers were slippery with blood, but she would not let go of the dagger. The hand over her mouth clenched more tightly, shutting off her air. Catelyn twisted her head to the side and managed to get a piece of his flesh between her teeth. She bit down hard into his palm. The man grunted in pain. She ground her teeth together and tore at him, and all of a sudden, he let go. The taste of his blood filled her mouth. She sucked in air and screamed, and he grabbed her hair and pulled her away from him, and she stumbled and went down. And then he was standing over her, breathing hard, shaking. The dagger was still clutched tightly in his right hand, slick with blood. You aren't supposed to be here, he repeated stupidly. All right, a lot just happened. Catelyn gets the bloody hand symbolism when she reaches up to pull the assassin's knife from her throat and cuts her hand. Ow. Next, she bites down hard on the flesh of the assassin's hand and gets the taste of his blood in her mouth, giving her the bloody mouth of a heart tree with the side of flesh-eating weirwood symbolism. When a weirwood moon figure like Cat eats a comet symbol like the assassin, his hand at least, that is a depiction of Azor Ahai going into, being eaten by, the trees. And this, of course, parallels the moon swallowing the sun's comet. It's just like when the woods swallowed the last slice of sun, 
and all that stuff we talked about last time. Accordingly, the Comet assassin figure has the bloody hand symbol too now. He is symbolically merging with the Weirwood moon figure, and so is sharing the same Weirwood bloody hand symbolism. We're going to see that pattern all throughout this episode. Now, just to get extra tricky, consider this. The cat's paw is like the solar lion's hand, his paw, and Lady Cat is, in a manner of speaking, eating the hand of the cat's paw. That would be the paw of the paw of the king lion, eaten by another cat, like some sort of macabre Russian doll trick. In turn, the cat's paw assassin also sliced up cat's hand, her paw, so you could say that the cat's paw bit cat's paw, and then cat bit the cat's paw's paw right back. At least, that's the kind of thing you'd say if you were raised on Dr. Seuss as I was. And that is what I call fractal symbolism. Notice the line about the assassin cursing in Cat's ear. It might be nothing, or it might imply the comet and meteors cursing the things they struck, which does make a certain amount of sense. Now, a moment later, the assassin's blade is clutched in his hand, now covered in Catlin's blood, in order to give us the idea of Lightbringer turned red by Nissanissa's blood. We'll see that type of symbol in most of the scenes we look at, either the Weirwood Moon Maiden reddening a sword with her blood, or else a sword being taken from the Weirwood Moon Maiden, like Graham being pulled from the Bran Stalker tree. We saw that at the burning of the Seven on Dragonstone, when Stannis pulled Lightbringer from the burning wooden chest of the Mother's statue. And don't forget that the Cat's Paw Assassin's Blade is Valerian Steel, spell forged in Dragonfire, and blood-soaked Valerian Steel is about as close to actual Lightbringer as we get. Also, Catelyn has now fallen to the floor, which of course depicts the fall of the Moon Maiden from Heaven after her encounter with the Comet. Next up, in terms of symbolism, we have the rising smoke. Bran's wolf, Summer, is elsewhere described as looking like silver smoke, so when he rises from the ground level up to the tower chamber to rip out the assassin's throat, we can see that as the rising smoke cloud which blots out the face of the sun. Catelyn saw the shadow slip through the open door behind him. There was a low rumble, less than a snarl, the merest whisper of a threat, but he must have heard something because he started to turn just as the wolf made its leap. They went down together, half sprawled over Catelyn, where she'd fallen. The wolf had him under the jaw. The man's shriek lasted less than a second before the beast wrenched back its head, taking out half his throat. Summer is a shadow made of silver smoke, which is the rising smoke and ash that shadowed the world. It would be nice if Joffrey, the sun person who sent the comet assassin, were here in person to have Summer rip out his throat. But since that's impossible and would kind of kill the plot, the assassin would seem to play the sun role too when he's killed by the smoke and shadow wolf. Of course, Joffrey's solar face is eventually darkened at the purple wedding by Kat's daughter, Sansa, with her moonlight-drinking poison black amethyst, seen by the ghost of Highheart as a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. Not only do these dark purple gems turn Joff's face a purple to match their own dark purple coloring, they are actually linked back to smoke and ash, because the poison at work, the strangler, is from ash shy, and is itself made by a process which involves being thickened by ash, according to the late great Master Cresson. You can see how tightly the symbolism correlates here. Ash and smoke are what kill the sun, whether it's a silver smoke shadow wolf or the ashy poison from Ashai. The idea that the smoke and ash which swallowed the sun can be associated with a wolf like Summer makes for a nice call out to the Norse myth of Skull and Hattie, the wolves who swallow the sun and moon at Ragnarok and cause the lights to go out, a myth I probably should have mentioned by now. Norse mythology buffs have probably been crying out, what about Skull and Hattie, for at least a couple of podcasts now, so there you go. Smoke Dark Grey Wind sends the same message as a wolf made of sun-darkening smoke, and as we discussed extensively last time, Ghost is a weirwood wolf that will swallow John the Sun King, just as the woods swallow the sun in the weirwood grove of Nine Scene. There's even a forest called the Wolf's Wood that does the same sun-swallowing trick, too, but we'll quote that scene a bit later in this podcast. You see the point, though, and that's the conflation of wolves and woods. A wood named after a wolf is essentially getting to the same idea as a wolf the color of a weirwood tree, and everybody is hungry for a piece of the sun. Returning to the Lady Catelyn scene, right after the line about the wolf taking out half his throat, it says that 
His blood felt like a warm rain as it sprayed across her face. That gives us two symbols we know well, the red rain of bleeding stars' meteor shower and the bloody face to suggest the bleeding face of the heart trees. Perhaps most importantly, it continues the symbolism of Cat as a blood-drinking, flesh-eating weirwood, as the assassin's blood is offered to her like a captive before the heart tree. I believe this would also be a Melii reference. Weirwood Cat is created by the blood that falls like rain, just as the Melii were created by the blood of the sky god Oronos, which fell from heaven like rain. Afterwards, Catelyn's scalp is left raw and bleeding where the assassin ripped out a hank of her hair. That's kissed by fire hair, which is now blood and fire hair to match the red blood and fire canopy of the Weirwoods. Cat's makeover is complete. Bloody hands, bloody mouth, blood and fire hair. It's the portrait of the burning tree I was talking about last time. She doesn't cry bloody tears, that comes at the Red Wedding, but her face is covered by the assassin's blood, giving her the bloody face of a weirwood. The other Catelyn as a weirwood clues here have to do with her speech. When she first sees the assassin, the words stick in her throat, the merest whisper, like a whispering weirwood. And when they find her later, her laughter dies in her throat. Some of the faces on the weirwood heart trees appear to be laughing, as we saw in the Grove of Nine, but more important is the idea of the silent scream of the weirwood, the weirwood bark, if you will. It's the sound that Ghost makes, the one that only John heard when he went back across the bridge and found newborn Ghost by himself in the snow. The silent scream implies someone who cannot speak, and the bloody mouth might suggest someone whose tongue has been torn out, which overlaps nicely with the idea of cutting the throat of a sacrifice. Now you'll recall that cutting someone's throat is sometimes referred to as giving them a red smile, just like a laughing weirwood has a red smile, and just like bloody-mouthed Cat with her mad, dying laughter. Additionally, the assassin tried to cut Cat's throat and nearly succeeded, which also works to imply the weirwood figure having their throat cut and thus being given a red smile. It's almost as if both the sacrifice and the weirwood itself have their throats cut, as if both are sacrificed to create the burning tree person. You'll notice that the cat's paw assassin, the comet person trying to merge with the weirwood figure by giving it a face, has his throat torn out by the wolf. Just as both cat and he have the bloody hand, they both get the throat-cutting red smile symbolism because they are symbolizing the merging of the green seer and the weirwood. Again, we might see a parallel with Ghost and John, as John had his throat cut and his spirit sent into his weirwood-colored wolf, who already has a red smile, just like the green seer dying to go into his weirwood tree. Also, Ghost and John may both ultimately end up dying to create the merged Wolfman skin changer zombie John. Of course, all of that draws a broader parallel to the sun and moon which destroy each other to create Azor High reborn meteors. Now, you really can't cut a weirwood's throat, but think about the symbol of the red smile. For a human, it means a throat cutting, but for a weirwood, a red smile is just a part of its face. Thus, cutting a weirwood figure's throat is like giving a weirwood a red smile, and that probably equates to giving a weirwood a face, complete with a bloody red smile. We're going to see a lot of throat cutting today, so I want to lay out this line of symbolism right at the beginning. There's another great weirwood symbol present here at Winterfell, and this great find comes to us courtesy of Ravenous Reader, the poetess. It has to do with the library. Following the incident, the cat's paw assassin is immediately believed to have set fire to the library tower as a distraction before his main attack. Whether he has set the fire or someone else, and there's all kinds of theories about that, a library is made of paper, meaning wood, and it's a repository of knowledge. Thus, it makes an outstanding symbol of the weirwood net, which is basically a library made out of wood. And just FYI, the library weirwood symbolism does seem to be expressed elsewhere. Take a look at the scrolls or books in any scene where they are being discussed prominently, and see what you can find. Now check out this quote from Jojen to Bran in A Dance with Dragons. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, said Jojen. A man who never reads lives only one. The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees, and the weirwoods above all. When they died, they went into the wood, into leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered all their songs and spells, the histories and prayers, 
everything they know about this world. Maesters will tell you that the Weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The Singers believe they are the old gods. When Singers die, they become part of that godhood. The Weirwood Net is directly compared to a library here, and thus the Comet Assassin figure setting the library tower on fire creates the burning tree symbol and works in parallel to him wounding Cat and transforming her into a bloody Weirwood. Cat sees the burning library, and it says, Long tongues of flame shot from the windows, a familiar symbol in A Song of Ice and Fire, which is also a symbol of the biblical Holy Spirit, which is nothing if not the representation of the fire of the gods that can live inside the hearts of men. Then she watched the smoke rise to the sky. In other words, the smoke is rising from the burning tree, a parallel to the silver smoke wolf rising to Bran's bedchamber when the fire is set. The Red Wooding. This section is brought to you by the Patreon support of one of our high priests of starry wisdom, the Black Maester Azizel of History of Westeros, Lord of the Feasible and Keeper of the Records, whose rod and mask and ring smell of coffee. Next, we come to the Red Wedding, or Wooding, as I called it. We're not going to do a breakdown of the entire Red Wedding, because that's a huge undertaking. We're just going to address Lady Catelyn's Weirwood makeover. We'll join the action in progress just after the killing has started. Now, the first thing that we'll make note of is that Cat takes a projectile wound. She ran toward her son, until something punched her in the small of the back, and the hard stone floor came up to slap her. That turns out to be no ordinary projectile, because a couple of sentences later, it says, Catelyn's back was on fire. This might seem like par for the course by now. The moon is set on fire by a projectile. But remember the cat is also acting out the role of a transformed weirwood being struck by lightning and set afire, so the reference to fire here is doubly important. It helps make her the tree struck by lightning. The spine is also the part of a human which is analogous to a tree's trunk, so setting Cat's back on fire is a pretty good depiction of the burning tree. The arrow itself was fired by the musicians in the upper gallery, which makes us think of green seers who sing magical songs to call projectiles down from heaven, a la the Hammer of the Waters fable. Next, Cat gets the bloody mouth. Her limbs were leaden, and the taste of blood was in her mouth. Leaden limbs are stiff limbs, kind of like a tree perhaps, but more importantly, Lead implies poisoning, which is an aspect of the Lightbringer Comet. Think of the black amethyst snakes, or Oberyn's poison-tipped sunspear, for example. The meteors are a toxic presence on the earth, it would seem, and I think part of the pain and rage on the faces of the trees might indicate a reaction to this toxic presence. I suggested last time that the association with grave worms and maggots that the weirwood roots have might be meant to imply that the weirwoods are mitigating or transmuting this toxic effect, and this also works in harmony with the notion of the Weirwoods as a trap that is restraining some sort of dangerous Minotaur-like monster. I'm not set on this, but the idea keeps popping up, so we'll have to keep it in mind. In any case, Cat seems to have a case of lead poisoning and stiff limbs to go with her burning spine and bloody mouth, so let's keep going. Next, as Rob is shot with crossbow bolts and many Starks and friends are cut down, sadly, Catelyn takes Walter Frey's lackwit grandson Jingle Bell hostage, and there's a direct tie made to the first scene with a cat's paw assassin. When she pressed the dagger to Jingle Bell's throat, the memory of Bran's sick room came back to her, with the feel of steel at her own throat. I believe this link is created between the two scenes because both scenes are similar and express the same ideas involving Cat turning into a weirwood. Now when Rob is killed, Cat cuts Jingle Bell's throat and it says, the blood ran hot over her fingers. That's a case of the bloody hands now to go with the bloody mouth, the makings for a solid case of weirwood stigmata. Just as when Summer tore out the cat's paw assassin's throat and the blood was like warm rain on cat's face, this is a depiction of human sacrifice to the weirwood trees. Now as for Jingle Bell, he's playing the role of sacrifice and his real name is Aegon, actually. You can't say the name Aegon without thinking of Aegon the Conqueror, of course, who rode a black dragon, Balerion, and wielded the sword Blackfire. Aegon the Conqueror is a pretty clear dark solar Azor High reborn figure, and therefore what we are seeing with Jingle Bell Aegon's sacrifice to Cat the Weirwood Goddess 
is yet another implication of a Zorahai being sacrificed to the weirwood. Now, immediately following the sacrifice, Cat will be given the bloody face part of the weirwood makeover, which seems to be the right sequence. A green seer is sacrificed, the tree is given a face, and then the spirit of the green seer can enter the tree. We will see this depicted in a moment by Catelyn losing her wits after she kills Jingle Bell, almost as if she is absorbing his fool's spirit. So right after Catelyn cuts Jingle Bell's throat in grisly fashion, cutting down to the bone, it says, Finally, someone took the knife away from her. This is showing us the Lightbringer being pulled from the burning tree symbol, which we introduced a few moments ago, and which I told you would appear in most of the scenes. Next, Catelyn goes mad and rakes her own face with her fingernails. The tears burned like vinegar as they ran down her cheeks. Ten fierce ravens were raking her face with sharp talons and tearing off strips of flesh, leaving deep furrows that ran red with blood. She could taste it on her lips. This sounds very much like a face being carved into the weirwood tree. Her face is literally being carved here, the blood running through furrows on Cat's face. The word furrow is suggestive of planting and sowing, as if the moon blood were about to grow something. And again, this is as literal a face carving as any human undergoes in A Song of Ice and Fire. The word furrow is also notable because the phrase furrows of Odin is a phrase which means runes. Now, in Norse languages, there exists something called a kenning, which is spelled the same way as house kenning of the Iron Islands, by the way, and which is defined as a circumlocation, which is an ambiguous or roundabout figure of speech, used instead of an ordinary noun. For example, instead of saying rune in a poem, the writer might say furrows of Odin, and everyone would understand that he meant rune. A rune is carved in wood or stone. Again, ash trees are the best choice for rune staffs, which is why it can be called a furrow. And obviously the runes are associated with Odin, so runes are furrows of Odin. In other words, I think Martin is drawing a link here between the face carving and Odin's runes, which of course makes a ton of sense, since the wedding of a green seer to a weirwood is basically the A Song of Ice and Fire equivalent of Odin's hanging on the Yggdrasil tree. We'll see another kenning referenced in Cat's death in just a moment, actually. As for the sharp implements doing the face carving, the black ravens, they are black meteor symbols, and so that's probably why George chose to use them as a metaphor here. It's another way to show the moon meteors setting the tree on fire, and specifically in conjunction with it receiving a face. As Ravenous Reader, the poetess, points out, it also makes her a better weirwood tree because she has ravens perching on her. Now our poor treed cat has a bloody mouth again too this time viscerally tasting the blood on her lips in a way that kind of reminds us of Bran watching the human sacrifice through Winterfell's heart tree, where it said that Brandon Stark could taste the blood. Then we get the bloody tears image and mercifully Cat's death. The white tears and the red ones ran together until her face was torn and tattered, the face that Ned had loved. Catelyn Stark raised her hands and watched the blood run down her long fingers, over her wrists, beneath the sleeves of her gown. Slow red worms crawled along her arms and under her clothes. It tickles. That made her laugh until she screamed. Mad, someone said. She's lost her wits. And someone else said, Make an end. And a hand grabbed her scalp just as she'd done with Jingle Bell. And she thought, No, don't. Don't cut my hair. Ned loves my hair. Then the steel was at her throat, and its bite was red and cold. Here we see the mutual throat cutting of Green Seer and Weirwood, just as we saw when both Cat and the Cat's Paw got the throat cutting symbolism in Bran's sick room. Just like in the sick room, we find Cat with the mad laughter again, as her laughter mixes with her screams thereby also suggesting the agony and ecstasy of Nissa Nissa. This is the part I mentioned a moment ago about Cat losing her wits, signifying that she is symbolically absorbing Jingle Bell's fool spirit. We are going to see this a bunch of times today, actually, the tree and the green seer sharing the same symbolism in the moments that they are depicted as merging. Last time it was a cat and a cat's paw, both with bloody hands and throat-cutting symbolism, and this time we have two lackwits getting their throats cut in identical fashion one after another. Most notable are Cat's bloody tears, which run together with her white tears, thus completing the basic part of the weirwood makeover 
Twins Edition. Usually, the bloody tears of the weirwood symbolism is achieved more symbolically, with eyes red from crying or some such, because Martin can't literally carve out a moon maiden's eyes every time he wants to symbolize the weirwood stigmata, of course. This, however, is one of the instances of real, genuine bloody tears, so together with the real, genuinely painful-sounding face carving, this is one of the very best examples of a Nissa Nissa moon maiden getting a weirwood makeover. Note also that her tears burn like vinegar, creating the burning tears, burning blood symbolism. When Kat raises her bloody hands, she's essentially striking a tree pose, as if she is actually turning into a tree in that moment, the moment just before she's given her red smile. Martin serves us up a juicy one next and turns the blood into worms crawling along her arms and under her clothes, which certainly reminds us of the graveworm-like weirwood roots that do the exact same thing to Bloodraven, weaving over, around, and through him. But wait, there's more. When we talk about bloody red worms, we must mention the only red dragon in all of A Song of Ice and Fire, Caraxes, the Bloodworm, ridden by that same Daemon Targaryen who took Bloodstone Island for his seat. A red dragon in A Song of Ice and Fire is, of course, primarily a symbol of Lightbringer, the Red Sword, or Red Comet, and that fits perfectly with what's going on here at the Red Wedding. As Cat transforms into a weirwood, we see a symbol of Lightbringer created from the blood of the dying Moon Maiden, just as we should. At the same time, it also depicts a weirwood Moon Maiden merging with Lightbringer, the Red Dragon, which was kind of the theme of the last episode. This is just the same as Cat becoming a fool to symbolize her as a weirwood absorbing Jingle Bell's spirit. Jingle Bell's also an Aegon, and so Cat is manifesting dragon symbolism. The bloodworm line is actually the other kenning that I mentioned. A bloodworm is a kenning which means sword. We already thought Caraxes the bloodworm was symbolizing the red sword of heroes, so take that as a confirmation. This also means Cat's blood is in a sense turning into swords as she dies, just as the moon explodes and becomes bleeding stars, which look like flaming swords. If I may say so, this is expert-level symbolism here. Martin has skillfully woven together the Moon Maiden symbols and Weirwood symbols all throughout the scene, with no better example than the Bloodworm symbol. Dragons, swords, bloody hands, and Weirwood roots are all implied in one densely packed line, which then took me four paragraphs to explain. The most important takeaway here is that Kat is symbolically turning into a weirwood tree, having her face carved, and manifesting Lightbringer and Dragon symbolism all in the same moment. This image is followed up on by one final bit of weirwood stigmata, as Kat is given her red smile. The knife that gives Kat her red smile has a bite that is red and cold, which is interesting. A red bite makes sense as a symbol of the comet striking or biting the Moon Maiden, and of the moon meteor striking the tree, but isn't Lightbringer supposed to be hot? Yes, it is, but frozen fire is both hot and cold symbolically, as is Valerian steel, which is forged in dragon fire but is repeatedly noted to be very cold to the touch. Comets are more of the same, appearing to burn hot, but of course comet tails are not made of fire and comets themselves usually contain a lot of ice. Cold red blood also makes us think of the frozen weirwood sap which looks like frozen blood, and that's a great fit to what is going on in the scene. It's implying Kat's red smile is red and cold, like the frozen blood of the weirwood smile, in other words. The cold red bite of the dagger also reminds me of Mel's repeated attempts to warn John about his own impending red smile, meaning his throat cutting by Wick Whittlestick. Ice, I see, and daggers in the dark. Blood frozen red and hard, and naked steel. It was very cold. It's the cold, frozen red blood symbol again, and as I said, this alludes to John's red smile. And that name, Whittlestick, it's implying wood carving, with John's neck as the wood. That fits well, because John is simply taking on the weirwood symbolism of his wolf in the moment that he's about to merge with his wolf, being given a red smile which is likened to wood carving. Ned's ice is perhaps the best Lightbringer symbol in the story, and it kind of combines all of these cold red blood ideas that we just mentioned. It's directly compared to the comet, it's Valyrian steel, it's named ice and is the sword most remarked upon as being cold, and finally, it's soiled with Ned's blood, reforged, and then appears to have the color of blood frozen into the ripples of its steel. 
As much as I love Oathkeeper, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but I did want to note that the cold red bite of the fray knife that cuts Catelyn probably plays into this line of ice and fire slash frozen blood symbolism. The broader point is that Cat is wounded by weapons with Lightbringer symbolism in both of the scenes of hers that we've examined today, first by the Cat's Paws Valyrian steel knife with a dragonbone hilt, and then by the fray knife with a cold red bite. Taken with the idea of raven meteors carving her bloody face, and all that bloodworm stuff, and I think it's clear that we're being shown that Cat is simultaneously playing the role of Nissa Nissa being stabbed by Lightbringer and playing the role of a weirwood being entered by Azora High and having her face carved. The basic implication seems clear. The forging of Lightbringer and the carving of the faces seem to be related events. This idea finds a companion in a description of the Red Comet that comes to us in Catelyn's inner monologue. It's from A Clash of Kings, to be specific, and here she is speaking with her uncle, Brynden Blackfish. She followed him out onto the stone balcony that jutted three-sided from the solar like a prow of a ship. Her uncle glanced up, frowning. You can see it by day now. My men call it the Red Messenger. But what is the message? Catelyn raised her eyes to where the faint red line of the comet traced a path across the deep blue sky, like a long scratch across the face of God. When we consider that the faces in the Weirwoods are the faces of the so-called Old Gods, the blades that carve those faces would then be scratching the face of God, just as the comet is here. The comet certainly was a scratch across the face of the moon, which can be regarded as a goddess. The Weirwoods seem to parallel the moon, and we keep seeing clues about Lightbringer-type weapons carving the faces in the Weirwoods. I think this means the same thing as the story about the thunderbolt setting fire to the tree. Something about the meteor impacts and the presence of Azor Ahai and his cronies in Westeros seems to have caused the face carving. In a perfect world, Azor Ahai or Garth the Green or someone like that used a knife made from a black moon meteor to carve the first weirwood face. So add that to the wish list of things that I hope to see in a brand weirwood vision of the past. But there are actually several ways I can think of that the Lightbringer and Azor Ahai carving the faces idea could play out. So setting aside that literal of an interpretation, Meteors are typically used to work magic in Lovecraft stories, or else have their own inherent magical effects, usually magically toxic effects, so it's more likely than not that the Bloodstone Emperor, who may be Azor Ahai, used his black meteor to work dark magic. Perhaps this had something to do with his ability to enter the trees and set the weirwood net on fire. The other obvious possibility, which I've mentioned before, is that the meteors themselves landed on Westeros and caused a magical reaction from the weirwood net, and something about this reaction is tied to the ability of green seers to enter the weirwood net. This would also make sense as the meteor setting the weirwood net on fire. I'm quite open to suggestions here. I feel confident that the meteors are linked to the carving of the faces and the green seers entering the weirwood net, but the specifics are more murky. One of the main reasons I think this is because the legend of the storm god's thunderbolt setting the tree ablaze and thereby allowing man to possess the fire of the gods strongly implies that the meteors somehow enabled the first green seers to enter the weirwood net. The burning tree fire of the gods is the weirwood net, and Grey King couldn't possess this fire until the thunderbolt struck. So there you go. You see what I mean. Likewise, he didn't possess the living fire of the sea dragon until after he slew her, which conveys the same idea. All right, now one final word about Kennings before we move on to the next section. Odin, in particular, is tied to Kennings. He's famous for having over 200 names in Kenning form, many of which have obvious implications for A Song of Ice and Fire, such as the Hanged God, Lord of the Gallows, Raven God, Lord of Battles, High One, Battle Wolf, Grey Beard or Hoary Beard, Barrow Lord, Yule Father, Mask, Hooded One, Wanderer, Father of Magical Songs, Flaming Eye, Shaggy Cloak Wearer, Wagon God or God of Riders, God of Runes, Mover of Constellations, and many more. That last one is a reference to Yggdrasil as the Cosmic Axis World Tree I'd like to point out. So I mentioned there is a House Kenning. Two actually, House Kenning of Harlaw on the Iron Islands, and a splinter branch in service to House Lannister on mainland Westeros called House Kenning of Case. You guys already know how the sigil clues work by now, so I'll just give them to you. 
House Kenning of Harlaw on the Iron Islands. Their sigil is the Storm God's Cloudy Hand, Pale Gray, Yellow Lightning Flashing from the Fingertips on Black. House Kenning of Case, meanwhile, has a sigil of four sunbursts countercharged on a quartered orange and black field, meaning two black suns and two orange ones. I'm not sure about the math, two and two, but we do recognize the black sun symbol as the dark solar king in the line of night, so it's nice to see a visual confirmation that Martin is indeed thinking about black suns as a general concept. Now, House Kenning of Case was founded by an ironborn warrior known as Herrick Kenning from the original Harlaw Kennings. His story involves a horn called the Horn of Herrick, which we actually see in the main story, as a Sir Kenos of Case accompanies Jamie in the Riverlands and blows the horn at a few crucial times. The horn, weirdly, is described an awful lot like the Dragonbinder horn and supposedly fake horn of Joraman that Melisandre burned, black and twisted and banded in old gold. Once they blow it to enter Raven Tree Hall, home of the Blackwoods and their huge dead weirwood tree. In other words, all the symbolism attached to either house kenning leads back to Azor High, the dead Greenseer, and the events of the Long Night. We have the Storm God's thunderbolt hurling hand, a horn seemingly meant to remind us of the more significant magical horns in the story, and the Black Sun symbol. House Kenning of Case on the mainland could be seen as kind of turning their cloak from the original Kennings, since they're now loyal to the Lannisters instead of the Ironborn, and this is probably the meaning of their Orange Sun, Black Sun sigil. It's showing us a bifurcation or transformation of the sun. Anyway, let's keep it moving. The Silent Sister This section is generously sponsored by Dire Liz of Heavenly House Aquarius, the Alpha Patron, a direct descendant of Gilbert of the Vines, the son of Garth the Green who founded House Redwine. You know we can't talk about Lady Cat without mentioning Lady Stoneheart as much as she enjoys hanging people. She has some great nicknames. The Silent Sister, Mother Merciless, The Hangwoman, Lady Freaking Stoneheart. Here is Brienne's encounter with her in Barrack's old cave in A Feast for Crows, which serves as a chilling introduction to this character, who was just a little too terrifying for HBO. A trestle table had been set up across the cave, in a cleft in the rock. Behind it sat a woman all in grey, cloaked and hooded. In her hands was a crown, a bronze circlet ringed by iron swords. She was studying it her fingers stroking the blades as if to test their sharpness. Her eyes glimmered under her hood. Grey was the colour of the Silent Sisters, the handmaidens of the stranger. Brienne felt a shiver climb her spine. Stoneheart. In other words, Cat has become a rather unfriendly psychopomp, who is primarily interested in feeding the crows, as one of the Brotherhood says. By the way, the kenning for warrior is feeder of ravens, something Martin may well have been inspired by. Essentially, Stoneheart is handing out one-way tickets to hell. If the entrance to the Weirwood Net is the entrance to a kind of realm of the dead, then Undead Cat is acting as the gatekeeper. Here is a physical description of Stoneheart a few pages further on. Lady Stoneheart lowered her hood and unwound the grey wool scarf from her face. Her hair was dry and brittle, white as bone. Her brow was mottled green and grey spotted with the brown blooms of decay. The flesh of her face clung in ragged strips from her eyes down to her jaw. Some of the rips were crusted with dried blood, but others gaped open to reveal the skull beneath. Lady Stoneheart still has weirwood symbolism, but it's kind of post-weirwood transformation. She's no longer such a good fit for the weirwood portrait of the burning tree, having lost the red hair and white skin symbolism. Her red hair is turned white as bone, which does match the bone-white branches and bark of the weirwood, and her pale skin has turned gray and green, a color pairing which has been used to symbolize gray king-type undead green seers. She lives underground in the cave like a green seer, and symbolically in the underworld where a zombie belongs. The words mottled and ragged are used, likening cat to the undead scarecrow line of symbolism, which also involves fools, who wear motley, thus making a straight line of foolishness and madness symbolism that runs through the scene in Bran's sick room, the Red Wedding, and now here in the cave. In other words, Stoneheart is more of a tree ghost within the Weirwood at this point, 
much like the ghost of High Heart or Blood Raven, the latter of which also has that problem, with the skull showing through the holes in the face skin that Stoneheart has. Note also that the ghost of High Heart and Blood Raven both have white hair like Stoneheart, despite having red eyes that still match a weirwood. Catelyn actually does get the red eyes of a weirwood, along with her fiery resurrection, and this quote is from that same Brienne chapter. The woman in grey hissed through her fingers. Her eyes were two red pits burning in the shadows. Drogon's eyes are like burning pits and red pits, and the weirwoods have deep carved red eyes, which are functionally red pits. This seems like the ember in the ashes, last coal in a dead fire symbolism that we examined in the last episode, alluding to an internal fire within Stoneheart. And indeed, Thoros speaks of Beric passing the flame of life into Cat in order to resurrect her. Cat kind of sort of whispers here too, the word used is hissing, and she's doing so through her fingers, almost like a weirwood whispering through its branches. Elsewhere in this chapter, her speech is called halting, broken, tortured, and also as part croak, part wheeze, and part death rattle. That reminds us a bit of Cold Hands' rattling voice and plays into the larger theme of having your throat cut and losing your voice that seems to be implied by the Weirwood's bloody mouths and silent screams, also known as Weirwood barks. Then there's this quote from the epilogue of A Feast for Crows, The Hanging of Peter Pimple. She don't speak, said the big man in the yellow cloak. You bloody bastards cut her throat too deep for that, but she remembers... She doesn't speak, but she remembers. Isn't that a perfect description of the Weirwoods? Now, the other line of symbolism that plays into our research here is what happens with Stoneheart's burning red eyes when she sees our favorite sword, Oathkeeper. He slid the sword from its scabbard and placed it in front of Lady Stoneheart. In the light from the fire pit, the red and black ripples in the blade almost seemed to move, but the woman in grey had eyes only for the pommel. A golden lion's head with ruby eyes that shone like two red stars. Cat has eyes only for the pommel. Actually, she has eyes which are like the red star eyes on the pommel, which are also a cat's eyes, since the pommel is a lion's head. It's Dr. Seuss land again. A cat with burning red eyes has eyes only for a cat with burning red eyes. Oathkeeper is a comet symbol, analogous to the cat's paw figures and their Lightbringer-esque weapons, and Cat and the Brotherhood even named the sword and the bear as a kind of cat's paw of the Lannister king. Jack B. Lucky, the one-eyed man, says that they should hang all three of them because they're lions. Lem Lemoncloak says to Brienne that there's a stink of lion about you, lady. And then they read the letter that Brienne carries, which puts the nail in the coffin. There is this as well. Thoros of Myrrh drew a parchment from his sleeve and put it down next to the sword. It bears the boy king's seal and says the bearer is about his business. Lady Stoneheart set the sword aside to read the letter. The sword was given me for a good purpose, said Brienne. Sir Jamie swore an oath to Catelyn Stark. Before his friends cut her throat for her, that must have been, said the big man in the yellow cloak. We all know about the Kingslayer and his oaths. That's an especially nice one, because in addition to naming Brienne and Oathkeeper as Cat's Paws of the Lannisters, the bearer is about his business, it doesn't get any more Cat's Paw than that, in addition to that, it also names the Freys who killed Cat as Cat's Paws of the Lannisters, doing Jamie's bidding. That means that both of Cat's weirwood transformations were triggered by Cat's Paws, by Agents of the Sun, which we interpret as the Comet, and that lines up perfectly with all the weapons that have attacked Cat having Lightbringer symbolism. As I mentioned, Oathkeeper is also a great comet and cat's paw symbol. Now the point of the clever wordplay around cat having eyes for and like the red stars on the lion pommel of Oathkeeper is the same as Melisandre having eyes like red stars or Ghost having eyes like embers. It indicates a moon weirwood symbol that has ingested the fire of the sun. Indeed, Oathkeeper's cat's pommel and Catelyn turned Lady Stoneheart are parallel symbols, I believe. Oathkeeper's lion pommel is the cat that has swallowed a red star, and the black and red blade would symbolize the comet that the lion swallowed. Longclaw, John's sword, is just like Oathkeeper. The red-eyed wolf pommel is Ghost, who swallows John, 
and because John's a black brother and a sword in the darkness, John parallels to Longclaw's black blade. It's like the wolf pommel is swallowing the black sword and reflecting that internal fire in its eyes, just as with the red star-eyed lion pommel on Oathkeeper, and just as with Cat being attacked, throat slashed, and face carved by Lightbringer symbols of various types, only to rise from the dead with burning red eyes. All of this symbolism is bolstered by Cat's new name, Stoneheart. She has a stone in her heart, like a heart tree that has swallowed a stone, or like Oathkeeper's lion pommel that has swallowed a bloody dragon blade. Weirwood trees get set on fire by dragon meteors and by green seers who play the role of meteors, the thunderbolt meteor to be exact. Think of Blood Raven like the dragon Nidhogg, sitting beneath the magical tree and animating it with his life fire. Blood Raven is like the meteor, like the stone which became the heart of the tree. So the name Stoneheart implies a tree woman with a meteor stone heart, someone who has swallowed a red star or red sun. We've also likened the King of Winter to a burning tree person. That's essentially what he is, a wicker man made of dead greenery who's waiting to be burned in the spring. That obviously has overlap with the idea of Nissa Nissa becoming a burning tree, so what's the deal with that? Well, it's important to remember that gender doesn't really exist with most trees, and certainly not with moons and suns and comets, nor with dragons for that matter. I talked about this last episode when I tried to explain that Nissa Nissa Reborn and Azora High Reborn are really just gender-appropriate titles for the same archetype. For example, Cat has everything she needs to play the King of Winter here in the cave, except for a direwolf. She's sort of fiddling with Rob's King of Winter crown, and she has Ned's old sword, too. And at the Red Wedding, Rob was actually acting in parallel to Cat. When he was first hit by an arrow, it says that he staggered suddenly as a quarrel sprouted from his side, which creates the image of a stag man growing wooden quarrels like tree limbs. Hat tip to my form friend Unchained for that great observation. Cat thinks that if he screamed, she did not hear it because the music was too loud, making it a silent scream like a weirwood, and a second later, Rob's voice is whisper faint, like a whispering weirwood. And remember that Rob won his most famous battle at the Whispering Wood. Finally, we have Roose Bolton saying his infamous words, Jamie Lannister sends his regards, and then thrusting the longsword through Rob's heart and twisting, making Rob, and by extension the King of Winter, some kind of Nissa Nissa moon figure, stabbed in the heart like Nissa Nissa. Like Nissa Nissa, and like the moon, the King of Winter parallels the weirwood trees, in other words. It's a thing waiting to be set on fire, just as the real King of Winter is in Green Man folklore, like I mentioned. One other note on Roose stabbing Rob by declaring himself to be a messenger of Jamie Lannister at the moment that he stabs Rob, Roose is identifying himself as yet another cat's paw assassin. And this creates another parallel between Rob as the King of Winter and Catelyn as a weirwood goddess, as both are killed by cat's paw figures at the same time. As kind of an adjunct to Catelyn, we'll now return to the Inn of the Crossroads, also called the Gallows Inn for a weirwood stigmata involving the death of the original owner, Masha Heddle. Masha Heddle is primarily mentioned in Catelyn's chapters, so she fits in well here with all the Catelyn and Lady Stoneheart stuff. Even though she's a minor character, her weirwood makeover scene unites much of the symbolism we've discussed here and in the last three episodes. This is from A Game of Thrones, when Tyrion meets his father at the Inn of the Crossroads after coming down from the Mountains of the Moon. The inn and its stables were much as he remembered, though little more than tumbled stones and blackened foundations remained where the rest of the village had stood. A gibbet had been erected in the yard, and the body that swung there was covered with ravens. At Tyrion's approach, they took to the air, squawking and flapping their black wings. He dismounted and glanced up at what remained of the corpse. The birds had eaten her lips and eyes and most of her cheeks, barring the stained red teeth in a hideous smile. Masha Heddle is famous for her sourleaf-stained mouth, which is referred to many, many times in the first book. It's called a ghastly red smile, a hideous red smile, and a bloody horror, so you get the idea. It's a creative way of giving someone the weirwood bloody mouth symbolism, and it works quite well because of these vivid descriptions. Of course, her red smile symbolism ties into the throat-cutting motif, which is shared by the red smile of the weirwoods, and being hanged amounts to the same thing since your throat is crushed. 
noticed that the crows eating her face compare well to Catelyn's fingernails being described as ten ravens when they disfigured her face, and of course to Bran's eyes being picked out by the three-eyed crow, and to the bad little boy who climbed too high and who had his face eaten out by crows. It's also worth noting that Masha was hanged at the command of a solar king, Tywin, just as Cat was wounded and then killed by people doing the bidding of Lannisters. More cat's paw symbolism, in other words. Overall, what we can say about Masha Heddle is that she is the Lady of the Gallows Inn, hung on the tree and given a weirwood transformation by the ravens and the sourleaf, carved out bloody eyes and a bloody smile. The blackened stone and ruined houses all around the inn and its gibbet helped to lend the vibe of a charred, smoking, ground-zero-type wasteland. The Gallows Inn itself represents a weirwood, as we saw in Garth of the Gallows, and the gibbet or gallows tree in the yard does the same thing. Of course, we expect to see burning tree and weirwood symbolism at Ground Zero, so that all checks out and works in support of Masha's weirwood transformation. Now, the configuration here is slightly different, because although her bloody eyes and red smile cast her in the role of the tree itself, Usually it is Azora High who is hung on the tree. Here it's the weirwood woman herself who is hung on the tree, and this might suggest that perhaps Nissa Nissa was a woman who was sacrificed to open up the harp tree for Azora High. Perhaps she went in first and became part of the tree, only to have Azora High then wed the tree and bond with it, or her as it might be. Tywin, a solar character, hanged Masha Heddle and then took up temporary residence in her inn, which kind of fits that pattern, so we'll have to keep this possibility in mind. Tyrion is an Azor High reborn figure, and he comes down from the Mountains of the Moon like a moon meteor, and also enters the weirwood symbol of the Gallows Inn, passing by the hanged and weirwooded Masha Heddle. There's one other honorable mention weirwood maiden that belongs with Cat, and that is Brienne, who I said is like a moon character that turns into an even star morning star character. The Venus of Tarth, Brienne the Beauty. We talked about her hanging on the tree in Garth of the Gallows, and about how she is repeatedly struck by lightning, so to speak, in various scenes. After she has the horrific fight with Rorge and then Biter, she is patched up a bit by the Brotherhood Without Banners and taken to Lady Stoneheart for judgment. And for a time, Brienne floats in a world of hazy half-dream. One of these dreams is worth a quick mention here. It's the one where she dreams of that time that Red Ronnet Connington he of the fire-red hair and beard, came to even Fall Hall to officially court her, except in the dream, Ronette becomes Jamie partway through. The main noteworthy thing is that when Ronette slash Jamie gives her the rose, she opens her mouth and blood pours out. She had bitten off her tongue while she waited. A rose from a sun character would be a stand-in for the comet, and to confirm this, we get the following lines from Brienne on a different occasion when she recalls facing Red Ronnet on the tourney ground and exacting her revenge for his courtship and the cruel prank he participated in with the other knights. In the melee at Bitterbridge, she had sought out her suitors and battered them one by one, Farrow and Ambrose and Bushy, Mark Mullendore and Raymond Nayland, and Will the Stork. She had ridden over Harry Sawyer and broken Robin Potter's helm, giving him a nasty scar. And when the last of them had fallen, the mother had delivered Connington to her. This time, Sir Ronnet held a sword and not a rose. Every blow she dealt him was sweeter than a kiss. It's the kissing and killing, sex and swordplay theme between these two, and the rose is now a sword. Then during Brienne's hazy half-conscious nightmare dream on the way to Stoneheart's lair that we were just quoting from, we get this line. He will bring a rose for you, her father promised her. But a rose was no good. A rose could not keep her safe. It was a sword she wanted. Oathkeeper. I have to find the girl. I have to find his honor. In other words, Oathkeeper is being likened to the rose. And indeed, it was Jamie who gave her Oathkeeper, just as he gives her the rose in this dream. The sun gives his fire to the Moon Maiden, which means that Brienne must be playing the Moon Maiden role in this dream, at least. Brienne having revenge on Red Ronnet would equate to the Moon Meteors killing the sun with meteor smoke, the lunar revenge motif, and the same is true when Brienne battles Jaime, a scene that will break down another time. Earlier in A Feast for Crows, Brienne dreams of her revenge on Red Ronnet, and we see that Jaime and Ronnet share another familiar symbol. 
Ronit had a rose between his fingers. When he held it out to her, she cut his hand off. The last detail has to do with Brienne's dress, made out like the sigil of House Tarth, a quartered gown of blue and red, decorated with golden suns and silver crescent moons. It's pretty great ice and fire unity symbolism, and more importantly, sun and moon unity symbolism. The merging of sun and moon is what converts the moon maiden to a falling even star after all. And finally, and this will be a preview of the next episode, Brienne has her second-hand shield painted to look like that of her ancestor, Sir Duncan the Tall, a falling green star and an elm tree on a field of sunset. That's basically a diagram of the thunderbolt meteor about to strike the tree and right at sunset when the sun is swallowed by the trees. All right, so that's our first batch of Weirwood Stigmata, with Lady Catelyn and Masha Heddle being vivid and precise depictions of women turning into Weirwoods, and Brienne being a less complete echo with only the bloody mouth, although she is hanged, rhetorically struck by lightning several times, and given a sword with Lightbringer symbolism. We'll also catch Brienne in another scene later on, whispering with a bloody mouth. Antler Eater. This section is brought to you by the patronage of Sir Imriel of Heavenly House Orion, spinner of the Great Wheel, formerly of House Jordain of the Tor, and now the earthly avatar of the Sword of the Morning. Up next, we have Melisandre of Ashai, whom we've talked about a fair amount in the last episode and in previous episodes. She's pretty well established as a Nissa Nissa fiery moon maiden figure, and we'll come across those familiar symbols even as we primarily shift our focus onto the way that Melisandre plays into the idea of Nissa Nissa as a weirwood. Just as with Catelyn, the moon maiden and weirwood maiden symbolism will appear side by side and intertwined with one another. Melisandre actually starts off looking the most like a weirwood of all the moon maidens. She has skin as pale as cream, while everything else is red. Of course, she has that red hair that's like blood and flame, which is comparable to Cat, Sansa, Ygritte, and a few others, but she also has the red eyes to better match a weirwood. She also wears red robes that are meant to look like shifting flame, with some layers looking like blood instead, so in basically every sense, she already looks like she is perpetually bleeding and burning, just like the weirwood. Here's a good example from the beginning of the Burning of the Seven scene in A Clash of Kings. Melisandre was robed all in scarlet satin and blood velvet, her eyes as red as the great ruby that glistened at her throat, as if it too were a fire. The weirwood sap that looks like blood crusts their eyes and mouth and can look like ruby as well, as we see in a line from A Game of Thrones that takes place inside the weirwood grove of nine. The wide, smooth trunks were bone pale. The nine faces stared inward. The dried sap that crusted in the eyes was red and hard as ruby. In A Dance with Dragons, Mel's ruby is called a third eye glowing brighter than the others. This is directly suggestive of third eye vision, a la Odin and the Green Seers. And in fact, the third eye phrase is used seven times in the series proper, and all of them refer to Bran's Green Seer abilities, except this one here with Mel's ruby. This is why the weirwood having ruby eyes is such great symbolism. It implies a link or similarity between Mel's ruby third eye vision and the ruby eyes through which a green seer looks when he opens his metaphorical third eye. Please remember, I'm not suggesting that Melisandre is necessarily a green seer, though that is not impossible if she is the daughter of Blood Raven and Shiera Sea Star, as Radio Westeros theorizes. That's a theory I put some amount of stock in. But the point is that Melisandre is symbolizing the archetypal burning weirwood which Azor High entered. That leads to our next point. Melisandre shows the signs of having swallowed the red fire of the sun. In the last episode, we discussed how Mel's eyes like red stars and how ghosts' eyes like embers both allude to the concept of moons and weirwoods swallowing the fire of Azor High. And today we've roped Lady Stoneheart and her burning eyes like red pits into this symbolism. Get it? Roped? It's a hanging joke. Call it gallows humor. Anyway, Melisandre's red eyes are also described as candles and torches, which is more of the same idea, and also as hot coals, 
which matches the description of Drogon's eyes right after he's born in the pyre of Khal Drogo. You'll recall Mel's famous lines from her fire vision in A Dance with Dragons. Blood trickled down her thigh, black and smoking. The fire was inside her, an agony, an ecstasy, filling her, searing her, transforming her. Mel also weeps, and it says, her tears were flame. This is great weirwood portrait stuff. The weirwood is a picture of a bloody and burning moon, and Melisandre is having her blood burned and seared by some kind of magical fire, which has gotten inside her. The same thing happened to Danny at the alchemical wedding when she had the fire inside her, and like Danny, Mel is clearly playing the Nissa Nissa role here, with the agony and ecstasy being a clear call out to the original Moon Maiden. Melisandre definitely has the fire inside her, it's safe to say, just like Danny. We see this not only in her eyes, but in the fact that she is, well, shagging a dude with a flaming red sword whom she thinks is Azor High Reborn. Melisandre often speaks of having Red Relora's fire inside her as well, and Relora is a god, so that is quite specifically the fire of the gods which Mel has swallowed. She is therefore a wonderful match to the trees and wolves that swallow the dying sunfire. That's a description of Stannis, if I ever heard one, by the way. He's a solar king, kind of, but he's really a solar king who's being overtaken by shadow and death, and who is turning into the dark solar king, the dying sunfire. That's also an archetype which overlaps with Night's King, whom Stannis shows signs of paralleling. Consider the new sigil that Stannis devises after taking up R'hllor worship, a crowned stag enclosed within a flaming red heart. When Mel carries this banner into a clash of kings, it's called the Great Standard of the Fiery Heart with the crowned stag within, as if it had been swallowed whole, which makes the point nicely. The burning heart has swallowed the stag, just like the burning heart tree, the weirwood, swallows the stagman, which is the garth or the horned lord that went inside the tree. I mean, just listen to the wording here. A fiery heart or a fiery heart tree. Both swallow a stag. At the Battle of the Blackwater, we get another depiction of this idea as Davos muses that the fiery heart was everywhere, though the tiny black stag imprisoned in the flames was too small to make out. Now we've pointed out the great wordplay with this banner before. A stag is also called an H-A-R-T heart, so this banner is actually a fiery heart inside a fiery heart. Another Russian doll trick. But think about that word imprisoned. The idea of the stag being imprisoned in the burning heart has to remind us of the weirwood heart trees as being garth traps, as being prisons for green seers. Melisandre is playing the role of the burning heart tree, and Stannis is the black solar stag, the dying garth, who is imprisoned in her flames. In order to make the shadow babies, Melisandre actually swallows Stannis's life fires. No dirty jokes, please. And this is mirrored by the banner with its burning heart that swallowed the Baratheon stag, imprisoning it. The burning heart, or burning heart tree, is the antler eater. Even better, and you know it always gets better when we follow these breadcrumb trails, Melisandre is a couple of times remarked upon as having a heart-shaped face. A heart-shaped face with eyes like rubies. That compares well to heart trees with faces and red eyes like ruby. Heart-shaped face, heart-shaped tree. Heart-shaped box! Radio Westeros pointed out that only Melisandre and her potential mother, Shiera Seastar, get this heart-shaped face description, so we know it's uncommon. It's specifically chosen as a defining element of Melisandre and her potential mother. I would say that it's also another tree woman clue, and a good one. Consider this quote from A Storm of Swords, as Davos lies delirious and stranded on one of the small rocky atolls in the Blackwater Bay, known as the Spears of the Merlin King, and pay attention to all the uses of the word heart in close proximity. It was her, Davos cried. Mother, don't forsake us. It was her who burned you, the Red Woman, Melisandre, her. He could see her, the heart-shaped face, the red eyes, the long coppery hair. Her red gowns moving like flames as she walked, a swirl of silk and satin. She had come from a shy in the east. She had come to Dragonstone and won Selyse and her queen's men for her alien god. And then the king, Stannis Baratheon himself. He had gone so far as to put the fiery heart on his banners. The fiery heart of R'hllor, 
Lord of light and god of flame and shadow, at Melisandre's urging, he had dragged the seven from their sept at Dragonstone and burned them before the castle gates. And later, he had burned the godswood at Storm's End as well. Even the heart tree, a huge white weirwood with a solemn face. So, to help us piece this together, in rapid succession we get Mel robed in fire with her heart-shaped face, then the fiery heart sigil and the fiery heart of R'hllor as an abstract concept, and finally a reference to the burning of the heart tree with a face at Storm's End, a literal burning heart tree. Four different takes on a burning heart, but on a deeper level, they're really all talking about the same thing. Melisandre is an embodiment of the burning tree, with her heart-shaped face, her ruby eyes, and her robes that swirl like living flame. When she sets weirwoods on fire, it's like looking in a mirror for her. One last note on that fiery heart banner, with Melisandre's burning heart swallowing Stannis' crowned stag. It's compared to the Red Comet by a fervent Queen Selyse. There is another way. Lady Selyse moved closer. Look out your windows, my lord. There is the sign you've waited for, blazoned on the sky. Red it is, the red of flame. Red for the fiery heart of the true God. It is his banner, and yours. See how it unfurls across the heavens like a dragon's hot breath? And you, the Lord of Dragonstone. Stannis' banner is already R'hllor's banner, and here that fiery stag banner is being compared to the Red Comet. The Red Comet, according to our theory, would correlate to the Green Seer, the stag man, who is swallowed in the fire of the burning heart tree, just as the comet is swallowed by the moon. What's interesting is that when Selyse says there is another way and points to the comet, she's actually trying to make the case to burn Edric Storm, another stag man, in order to wake a dragon from stone. That's more of the same symbolism. Imprison the stag man inside the flames, and on the other side, you get the birth of a dragon. Now, I'd like to have a quick word about the symbolism of the heart in general. This is important, so check this out. The heart as a symbol is quite flexible. The dawn meteor is called the heart of a fallen star, so we know that a meteor can be a heart. But if that meteor came from a moon, then it's the heart of a fallen moon, so the moon must have a heart. And R'hllor himself is the heart of fire, so what does that mean? Well, it means that R'hllor is the essence of fire itself and that everything that is fiery is channeling his fiery power. Melisandre, praying to R'hllor, says, You are the light in our eyes, the fire in our hearts, the heat in our loins. Yours is the sun that warms our days, yours the stars that guard us in the dark of night. So when Mel speaks of R'hllor as the heart of fire, it means the source of fire. Whatever R'hllor touches then becomes a new fiery heart, in possession of the fire of the gods, and capable of touching others and spreading the fire, just as real fire spreads. Melisandre speaks of people having their hearts bathed in God's holy fire, or of hearts that burn with the shining light of R'hllor, and that means that they've been touched by R'hllor and now possess the fire of the gods. So now think about the astronomy. The sun is the source of fire in the sky, the best incarnation of the fiery heart of R'hllor. The comet itself is a slice of the sun, a bit of fire that looks like a fiery heart, according to Selyse, and it then sets the heart of the moon on fire. Now the moon has been touched by R'hllor and has a burning heart, and when it sheds the fiery meteor dragons, those two are like fallen star hearts that carry with them the fire of the gods and can in turn catch more things on fire, just as the thunderbolt carried the fire of the gods to earth and set the heart trees ablaze. So now the trees have fiery hearts too. In other words, the heart is not like a sword, which can only symbolize a meteor, but rather a dynamic symbol that represents the transfer of the fire of the gods from one thing to another. George does love the human heart in conflict after all, and the same appears to hold true for hearts of stars and suns. The important thing here is Melisandre. Like the Weirwood, she is a portrait of the burning moon, perpetually frozen in that moment of incineration. She always appears in the moment of being caught on fire, the moment when the fire touched the secret hearts of the logs in Drogo's pyre, if you remember, the moment when the thunderbolt meteor set the tree ablaze. She never shows us the after phase of the moon, when it turns to black meteors. That role is played by her shadow babies, or her black leeches, or even her blackened blood. Now, she may well be hiding her true nature with illusion, so who knows what she really looks like, 
but as far as we see, Mel herself always looks to be on fire as the weirwood does. All right, so Melisandre, the burning heart tree woman, swallows stags for breakfast. And not just Stannis either. Of course, you remember Crescent's A Clash of Kings prologue chapter, where he tries to kill Melisandre by drinking poisoned wine with her. That wine contains the Strangler, the same poison from a shy, made with ash, that kills Joffrey in a storm of sorts. It's a memorable scene, but there's an important detail that is easy to overlook. Patchface danced closer, his cowbells ringing, clang-a-lang, ding-ding, clink-clank, clink-clank. The maester sat silent while the fool set the antlered bucket on his brow. Cresson bowed his head beneath the weight. His bells clanged. Perhaps he ought to sing his counsel henceforth, Lady Selyse said. That's right. Cresson is wearing the antlered fool's helm when he offers himself up like a sacrifice to Melisandre, the burning tree woman. Calling him a singer adds the connotation of those who sing the song of Earth, the children of the forest, and of course we suspect that if green men are some sort of elvish humanoid race, they would be something like taller children of the forest. But the antlers are the main thing. It makes Cresson a sacrificed stag man. Here are the lines right before his death. She met him beneath the high table with every man's eyes upon them, but Cresson saw only her. Red silk, red eyes, the ruby red at her throat, red lips curled in a faint smile as she put her hand atop his own around the cup. Her skin felt hot, feverish. It is not too late to spill the wine, Maester. No, he whispered hoarsely. No. Melisandre is given a hint of a red smile here to go along with her red eyes, as it says, red lips curled in a faint smile, and of course she's drinking the blood red wine like a weirwood drinking blood. The wine is twice noted to be sour, and reds are frequently described as sour in A Song of Ice and Fire, linking it to the sour leaf, which also makes people look as though they have been drinking blood. The fact that Melisandre speaks of fire cleansing and is able to transmute the poison is yet another suggestion of the weirwoods being able to transmute the poison of the moon meteors and perhaps the Zorhai himself, poisonous bastard that he is. Symbolically, Melisandre is drinking Crescent's offered blood, just as Cat tasted the blood of the Cat's Paw assassin. Crescent and the Cat's Paw Assassin's symbolism actually compare pretty well. The Cat's Paw Assassin had horse symbolism about him, if you recall, and here Crescent whispers hoarsely. The Cat's Paw had sacrificed stag symbolism via the leather sack of silver stags that he buried in the stables, and here Crescent dies with antlers on his head. In fact, this scene with Crescent and Melisandre compares well to the other of Catelyn's weirwood stigmata scenes, because Crescent is wearing a fool's stag helm when he's sacrificed to Melisandre, just as the fool Jingle Bell Frey is sacrificed to Cat. Here are the last lines of Crescent's prologue chapter. Crescent tried to reply, but his words caught in his throat. His cough became a terrible thin whistle as he strained to suck in air. Iron fingers tightened round his neck as he sank to his knees. Still he shook his head, denying her denying her power, denying her magic, denying her god. And the cowbells pealed in his antlers, singing fool, 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 while the red woman looked down on him in pity, the candle flames dancing in her red, red eyes. Notice that the text just says the cowbells pealed in his antlers, omitting mention of the helm and thereby making it really sound as if Crescent has antlers growing out of his head. But the point of comparison to Jingle Bell is, of course, the Fool character and the bells, which ring and sing while Crescent dies as his signature Ground Zero fiery dancers appear in Melisandre's eyes. Thus you can see that, as I said, both Catelyn's weirwood scenes are paralleled in Crescent's death scene. The Cat's Paw assassin actually has weak Fool symbolism too, because Catelyn thinks that he's repeating himself stupidly when he says, You weren't supposed to be here, over and over again. There's one other instance of a fool being slain before a heart tree, this time a real heart tree instead of a symbolic one, and it too parallels Crescent's death. We don't have time to cover that whole scene in depth at the moment because it's a bit off topic, but I do have to mention that Brienne kills Shagwell the fool before the Weirwood at the Whispers. And in fact, Shagwell is actually hiding in the Weirwood canopy when they make their approach. He drops down from the weirwood, armed with a triple morning star. 
That's a great symbol of the three heads of the dragon meteors coming from the moon tree and the celestial canopy and identifies this fool as someone who has attempted to climb the tree, which means wetting the tree in order to climb the heavens. The sum of it is that Brienne uses a Valyrian steel sword to effectively make blood offering to the weirwood, shedding the blood of the mummers with Oathkeeper and then burying Dick Crab in a grave directly beneath the weirwood. Brienne seems to be playing a gatekeeper role here, kind of like Stoneheart, sending people to the other side via the use of a weirwood and a black dragon sword. Brienne and Shagwell both get bloody hands here, Shagwell from digging Dick Crab's grave with his bare hands, and Brienne when she stabs Shagwell repeatedly in the gut. Brienne screams at Shagwell to laugh as she is stabbing him with the dagger, but it says that Shagwell never laughed. The sobs that Brienne heard were all her own. When she realized that, she threw down her knife and shuddered. That's interesting because it gives Brienne tears to go along with her bloody hands, and it also creates the agony-ecstasy dichotomy with laughing and crying. Finally, Brienne tosses two golden dragons into the grave with Nimble Dick in order to keep her promise to him, but of course that simply implies dragons in the roots of the magical tree, just like Yggdrasil and Nidhogg, or like Bloodraven the dragon under his weirwood. It also implies planting the dragons like seeds, which reminds us of the idea of meteors as star seeds. On a basic level, it's showing dragon meteors landing on the tree, as per the thunderbolt burning tree myth. But we still aren't done with parallels to Crescent and Melisandre's scene. Now because Crescent is a maester, we also find a parallel with Maester Lewin's death before the Winterfell heart tree. This is right after Bran, Rickon, Hodor, Jojen, Mira, and Asha the Wildling have come out of hiding in the Winterfell crypts after Ramsay's sack of Winterfell, and they find a nearly dead Maester Lewin in the Godswood. On the edge of the black pool, beneath the shelter of the heart tree, Maester Lewin lay on his belly in the dirt, a trail of blood twisted back through damp leaves where he had crawled. The idea of Lewin as a sacrifice to the heart tree is clearly implied when Lewin finishes instructing the rest of the party on what to do and where to go. Good, the maester said. A good boy. You're your father's son, Bran. Now go. Osha gazed up at the weirwood, at the red face carved in the pale trunk. And leave you for the gods? I beg, the maester swallowed. A, a drink of water and another boon, if you would. Lewin is also coughing up blood in this scene, with the red spittle on his lips getting a specific mention. But the best part of all of this is who finally kills him, Asha. Asha, the wildling, whose name sounds a lot like Ash. We're going to talk about Asha and Asha Greyjoy in just a minute because of that very fact, and because they both have tree woman symbolism. And let's not forget, Martin seems to already be using the Ash play on words to imply an Ash tree woman in the name of Melisandre of Ashai, so it shouldn't surprise you that he might be doing the same with Asha and Asha. Asha the Wildling does the same thing that Melisandre does, executing a maester in front of a weirwood symbol. It's worth noting that both times, the maester brought death upon himself, since Lewin asked for the gift of mercy from Asha, and Cresson resigned himself to dying in order to try to kill Melisandre. We're going to talk more about Asha and her tree symbolism in a bit when we talk about Asha Greyjoy, but by way of example, consider that Asha sometimes carries Bran around, just like Hodor does, and Hodor is playing the role of a wicker basket and a weirwood tree when he carries Bran around, or when Bran's skin changes into his body, which is Hodor carrying Bran's spirit around. Asha is twice called Wiry Strong, so she's got a basket kind of vibe going on. So, returning to Melisandre and Cresson, you can see that Cresson's sacrifice of himself to Melisandre is actually playing into a group of scenes which all seem to have something to do with sacrificing people to weirwood trees. The dominant theme seems to be a horned lord figure being sacrificed, but we need to follow up and see how maesters and fools play into the symbolism here. Cresson is all three, maester, fool, and stagman, and his life is given to the weirwood goddess in some sort of blood-drinking ritual. This also works as a foreshadowing of Melisandre playing the role of succubus to Stannis, siphoning off his life fires for her magical procreation. More antler eating, in other words. Blood Shadow Sex Magic 
This section is made possible by the steadfast support of Fire Wren, High Master of Pi Island, and High Priestess of the Church of Starry Wisdom. When Melisandre swallows Stannis' life fires in a kind of sex magic version of the fiery heart swallowing the stag banner, they produce one of the more twisted versions of Azor High Reborn, or perhaps one of the most revealing. The shadow assassins are black meteor symbols, like the dragons and like the ravens and like the Night's Watch brothers, and carry their own dark messages for us to interpret. The process works like this. Melisandre peels a slice off of Stannis' fire, and with it, she makes the shadow baby assassins, which in turn look like Stannis. It's a perfect depiction of Azor Ahai, the dark solar king, being reborn through Nissa Nissa, being reborn through the burning moon, and being reborn through a weirwood, all in one. Check out this quote from A Storm of Swords, which describes the process. No, perhaps he should have lied and told her what she wanted to hear. But Davos was too accustomed to speaking truth. You are the mother of darkness. I saw that under Storm's End, when you gave birth before my eyes. Is the brave Ser Onion so frightened of a passing shadow? Take heart, then. Shadows only live when given birth by light. And the king's fires burn so low I dare not draw off any more to make another sun. It might well kill him. Melisandre moved closer. With another man, though. A man whose flames still burn hot and high. If you truly wish to serve your king's cause, come to my chamber one night. I could give you pleasure such as you've never known. And with your life fire, I could make... A horror. Davos retreated from her. There you go. I just wanted you to get it straight from the books. This is the same idea that we've been talking about, with the woods swallowing the last slice of the sun. But people and trees and moons who get this fire inside them only seem to birth shadows. Davos calls Mel the mother of darkness, and that's right on so many levels. The moon gave birth to the black meteors and the darkness, and the weirwood net seems to give birth to Azor High Reborn. If the others came from the weirwoods in some sense, as many suspect, then the trees might have given birth to those shadows too. The scene where Mel gives birth to the shadow babies takes place in a dark cave beneath Storm's End, with its very old and massive weirwood tree above. It's actually warded by magic. This Storm's End is an old place. There are spells woven into the stones, dark walls that no shadow can pass, ancient, forgotten, yet still in place. At the risk of stating the obvious, that compares pretty well to Bloodraven's cave underneath the Weirwoods, which Coldhand says is warded so that the Whites cannot enter. This might imply a symbolic link between Mel's birthing of the Shadow Babies beneath Storm's End and the Green Seers wetting the trees in the caves beneath the Weirwood Groves, and I believe that the rest of Storm's End's symbolism supports this. In Weirwood Compendium 3, Garth of the Gallows, we saw that the castle of Storm's End is like an upthrust fist which blots out the stars, a version of the rising column of smoke and ash which caused the darkness of the long night. Beneath this cloud of smoke symbol, we should find symbols of weirwoods and meteor impacts. And boy, howdy do we ever. We already talked about the Dern and Elenai stuff last episode, and about how Storm's End is the place where the goddess landed, if you will, where she symbolically came down to Earth. We saw Renly put on his green stagman armor, only to be sacrificed in that same scene where Storm's End was a deeper darkness through which no stars could shine. We mentioned the huge old weirwood in the godswood there and how Melisandre eventually has Stannis burn it, which nicely places the burning tree symbol under the smoke cloud symbolism of the castle where it belongs. Note also that Mel doesn't actually burn the weirwood, she has Stannis do it. And the same is true for the burning of the Seven on Dragonstone. Why? Because it's better symbolism. Azor Ahai is supposed to be the one who sets the tree on fire. Of course, the point of all this is that Melisandre's shadow birthing will be another display of burning tree and burning moon symbolism beneath Storm's End. So now, check out the lines from A Clash of Kings as Melisandre and Davos row towards the mouth of the cave beneath the castle. The seaward side of Storm's End perched upon a pale white cliff. The chalky stones sloping up steeply to half again the height of the massive curtain wall. A mouth yawned in the cliff, and it was that Davos steered for. 
as he had sixteen years before. The tunnel opened on a cavern under the castle, where the storm lords of old had built their landing. It's tempting to see the tall, pale white cliff below the castle as a kind of weirwood trunk, seeing as how it has a yawning mouth, which is about to eat the black ship and its fiery cargo. In fact, consider me tempted. The cave's mouth is remarked upon a second time as they navigate through the jagged rocks of the entrance, and the idea of a yawning mouth implies sleeping and dreaming. The cave mouth is also eating people in this scene, which correlates to human sacrifice to weirwoods, as well as green seers' bodies being slowly eaten by the trees. This cave mouth in the pale white cliff is also where the storm lords of old built their landing. Much like the name King's Landing, this would seem to be a clue about meteors landing, and perhaps about storm lords going into the weirwood net, into the mouth of the tree. That's how you get there. Once inside, Melisandre plays the role of a Nissa Nissa weirwood. She shrugs out of her smothering robe, and her pale as cream skin shines, a light in the darkness. Think of the black gate weirwood face, glowing faintly like milk and moonlight in the pitch blackness of the well shaft. Mel's eyes are like hot coals, and her blood is black again, presumably from the burning effect of fire magic. We also get the line, her cry might have been agony or ecstasy or both, one of those easy to spot Nissa Nissa symbols. Then the arrival of the dark child, who takes the form of a tower of smoke and darkness. The whole of the shadow slid out into the world and rose taller than Davos, as tall as the tunnel, towering above the boat. We've talked about these shadow babies many times. They represent the black meteor children of the second moon. But now that we've identified some sort of weirwood symbolism with the Nissa Nissa characters, we should consider how the black shadow children might be related to the weirwoods. I already mentioned that the black ravens that like to erupt in clouds are terrific black meteor symbols which are attached to the weirwoods, and that's true, but I think there is more black meteor symbolism going on with the weirwoods, and I think that has to do with the Night's Watch. When the ghost of High Heart speaks of the shadow baby, she describes it as a shadow with a burning heart. That reminds me of the scene with Stannis, Melisandre, and the leeches that we looked at last time, when Mel speaks of needing men whose hearts are fire to fight the others in the long night. The Night's Watch, those shining fiery swords in the darkness, fit this description. John is described with the line, All in black, he was a shadow among shadows in A Clash of Kings, and you will recall the rangers in the Grove of Nine scene being carved from shadow. The Night's Watch are black shadows, but they fight the others and the whites with fire and with frozen fire. We also saw the embers in the ashes of Mel's fire vision turn into the Night's Watch brothers at the Fist of the First Men, one of the many instances of the Night's Watch being associated with the symbolism that relates to Azor High, the ember in the ashes symbol in this case, as well as things like the symbolism of the burning Scarecrow Night's Watch brothers that relates to Beric, Blood Raven, and the King of Winter that we've examined in the past. So if anyone fits Mel's description of men whose hearts are fire to fight the others, it's the Night's Watch, the fire that burns against the cold. Consider the Black Gate once again. I just compared Shining Melisandre in the cave beneath Storm's End to the Black Gate Weirwood face beneath the Night Fort. Shining cream versus glowing milk, if you will. The comparison is more than that, though, and speaks to functionality. Melisandre acts as a gateway for Black Shadows to enter the world, and so does the Black Gate, because it only lets Black Brothers pass through. That's probably the reason why it's called the Black Gate, despite being white, incidentally, because it only opens for men in black who recite their vows. The Shadow Babies are assassins, murderers, and a gathering of crows is, of course, called a murder of crows. Additionally, many refer to the Night's Watch as a group of thieves, rapists, and murderers, and more than a few of them are, in fact, murderers. Finally, at the risk of repeating myself, I'll say again that the mythical astronomy lines up here. The Shadow Babies and Black Brothers are both black moon meteor symbols, and they both issue forth from moon symbols, the Black Gate and Melisandre's Dark Womb. In other words, the Shadow Babies with burning hearts seem to parallel the Night's Watch in many ways. This is where the green zombie idea fits in. If the original Night's Watch, likely the last hero's 12, were resurrected skin changers and green seers, as I propose, then they would have been reborn through the fiery womb of the Weirwood Net. I keep saying how the Night's Watch swearing their vows to the heart trees 
might be a reenactment of Greenseers being resurrected as the first Black Brothers, the first Crows. They would have been Black Shadows with burning hearts, reborn from the Weirwood Goddess. That is what I think happened, and I think that is the basic message of all of these scenes with Melisandre playing the role of a Weirwood Goddess. She swallows the life fires of stag men, just as I believe the original twelve Night's Watch gave their lifeblood to the heart trees. Then Melisandre gives birth to black shadows with burning hearts, deathly versions of the living stag man that she swallowed, and this correlates to the weirwood heart trees giving birth to reborn undead stag men who were Night's Watch brothers, carved from shadow. Here I'd like to remind you that when we saw the shadow baby murder Renly, it was twice remarked upon to be wielding a shadow sword, a black sword, in other words, just as the Black Brothers are swords and wield black knives of obsidian, or ideally smoke dark Valyrian steel swords. In essence, I have already suggested that the last heroes twelve were undead green seers or skin changers, so the likeness between Mel's shadow killers and the Black Brothers carved from shadow seemed like a further corroboration of this. And because we all like corroboration, the more the merrier. I will unleash a juicy bit of symbolism that I've been squirreling away for a special occasion, which again seems to reinforce the idea of the last hero and his twelve being sacrificed to heart trees in order to be resurrected as green zombie Night's Watch brothers. The weirwood goddess in this scene will not be a woman, but Naga herself, the mighty sea dragon. I'm just going to let Mr. Martin Lewis read it for you and see what you can make of it. This is from The World of Ice and Fire, concerning the end of the tradition of the king's moots and the driftwood crowns. The final fatal blow against the power of the captains and the kings assembled was dealt when Uragon IV himself died after a long but undistinguished reign. It had been the dying king's wish that the high kingship pass to his great nephew, Euron Greyiron, salt king of Orkmond, known as Euron Redhand. The priests of the Drowned God were determined not to allow the power of king's making to be taken from them for a third time. So word went forth that the captains and kings should assemble on Old Wick for a king's moot. Hundreds came, amongst them the salt kings and rock kings of the seven major isles, and even the lonely light. Yet scarcely had they gathered when Euron Redhand loosed his axemen on them and Naga's ribs ran red with blood. Thirteen kings died that day, and half a hundred priests and prophets. It was the end of the king's moots, and the Red Hand ruled as high king for twenty-two years thereafter, and his descendants after him. The wandering holy men never again made and unmade kings as they once had. Thirteen kings, sacrificed to the weirwood ribs of the sea dragon, making the white wood run red with blood. The killer? A man named Red Hand, like the bloody red hand-shaped weirwood leaves. His other name, Euron, actually makes us think of Euron Crozai, Pirate Odin on Bad Acid, as I call him, a man who bears similarities to Blood Raven and the Bloodstone Emperor, with all kinds of twisted, corrupt Greenseer symbolism. Elsewhere in the world of ice and fire, speaking of the demise of the driftwood tradition, it says... That era ended with Euron Redhand and the slaughter on Old Wick. Henceforth, the crown of the Iron Islands would be made of black iron and would pass from father to son by right of primogeniture. This black iron crown is far more appropriate for an undead Lord of Death figure like Euron Redhand or Euron Crow's Eye, whose Tiwau spoiler chapter reveals a similar type crown, or to the King of Winter and his black iron crown of swords. This sounds like the transformation of a green seer, who would wear a weirwood crown, so to speak, into the undead, corrupted green seer figure reborn through the weirwood net that we've been catching signs of. The thirteen he sacrificed to Naga's ribs would be the last hero in his twelve, of course, and there is even a hint of green men rising to take revenge on Euron Redhand. The World of Ice and Fire notes that Euron Redhand faced a half a dozen rebellions, two thrall uprisings, and this. The most telling blow was struck by King Garth VII, the Golden Hand, King of the Reach, when he drove the Iron Men from the Misty Islands, renamed them the Shield Islands, and resettled them with his own fiercest warriors and finer seamen to defend the mouth of the Mander. 
Make what you will of that last bit. The main part is the sacrifice of thirteen kings that made Naga's ribs run red, slaughtered by the red hand. Naga's ribs are introduced thusly in a feast for crows. Four and forty monstrous stone ribs rose from the earth like the trunks of great pale trees. And since they are almost surely petrified weirwood, they function like a weirwood circle. Recall also the weirwood circles on Sea Dragon Point, which work as a complementary clue about sea dragons and weirwood circles. So in terms of symbolism, the sacrifice is being done inside the sacred grove, if you will, and thus I think it's pretty good evidence supporting the idea of the last hero and his companions as intentionally sacrificed skin changers and green seers. The driftwood kings and drowned priests that the Red Hand killed weren't resurrected. However, the drowned priests are basically famous for their drowning and CPR resurrection ritual, something Patchface the Stagman Fool experiences the real version of. Thus, the implication of resurrection is there, making this an even better echo for the hypothesized ritual killing of the last hero's companions. A Shy Maiden this section is brought to you by the Patreon support of one of our High Priestesses of Starry Wisdom, Singxia, Queen of the Summer Snows and Burner of Winter's Wick. So far, our study of the Nissa Nissa Moon Maiden archetype as a burning tree woman has centered around the weirwood stigmata symbolism that literally makes some of our moon maidens look like weirwood trees. We have more stigmata to come, including one which is as good or maybe even better than Cat's transformation at the Red Wedding. But now I want to bring in a separate but related layer of the Nissa, Nissa archetype, which also depicts a burning tree woman, that of the Shy Maiden. Don't be fooled. This moniker is not what it seems. It has everything to do with women who have burning ash tree symbolism and nothing to do with women who are shy, who are shrinking violets, if you will. Melisandre is the first example of an Ashai maiden, and she's obviously neither shy nor a maiden. It's wordplay. Think of the shy maiden character as something of a sub-archetype of Nissa Nissa, in the way that the black dragon is kind of a sub-archetype of the larger Azor Ahai Reborn character. What we're about to see is that the shy maiden is associated with three of our favorite things, trees, fire, and the moon. More specifically, it will be ash trees, burning trees, and shy flames that are like women, with moon references worked in. As you might guess, we will also see signs of the weirwood stigmata present at the same time, which is why I decided to bring up the shy maiden at this point, so we can get a more complete picture of Nissa Nissa as a burning tree moon maiden. The shy maiden archetype seems to be heavily based on those Greek ash tree nymphs that I mentioned at the beginning, the Melii, born from the shed blood of the sky god Oranos. The basic connection is apparent. The Melii are female spirits of the ash tree, and the weirwoods, which our moon maiden keeps turning into, are based on the ash tree Yggdrasil, making them ash tree maidens of a sort already. Recall also that the Melii ash tree nymphs, or dryads, are associated with spears, arming their human offspring with spears made from their ash trees, and in turn we find that many of our shy maidens will be wildling spearwives, Asha, Rowan, and Ygritte. These spearwives all worship the old gods, the weirwood trees and the green seer spirits inside them, in other words, making them excellent devotees of the burning ash tree that the weirwoods symbolize. Melisandre, the shy, not quite a maiden, meanwhile, dreams repeatedly of the eyeless, severed heads of Garth Greyfeather, Black Jack Bulwer, and Harry Hal, which John and Mel later find mounted atop the infamous Ashwood Spears to make that clever weirwood diagram that we took a look at in In a Grove of Ash. So while Mel isn't a spearwife, the spears and the black and bloody heads are very important to Melisandre's personal symbolism and character arc, something that we took a look at in Bloodstone Compendium 3, Waves of Night and Moonblood. Now it may or may not be coincidence, but Melii does sound a bit like Mel from Ashai, or Melanie, which is Melisandre's original name. Mel obviously does not worship the weirwoods, the demon trees, as the Reloris call them. Instead, she sets them on fire, or has Stannis do that. This is antagonistic in terms of the main plot, but in terms of symbolism, setting the weirwoods on fire simply makes them a more literal symbol of the burning tree which they are meant to represent. We'll pick up the trail of the Shy Maiden with a really cool scene involving Asha the Wildling, 
and then we'll quickly incorporate Asha Greyjoy and Rowan the Spearwife, with Theon sort of running in and out of all of their scenes. Most of this will take place at Winterfell, although we will pay a quick visit to the Riverlands, as well as a riverboat on the Rhoyne, and a lonely campfire in the Frostfangs. Now earlier we saw Asha kill Maester Lewin beneath the heart tree, and she kills another person in an interesting way when she helps Bran, Rickon, Hodor, and the Reeds escape Winterfell. It's one of Theon's ironborn guards, Drennan. He has a lot in common with all the people that we've seen sacrificed to weirwood tree figures and weirwood trees in this episode. For starters, Drennan and the other guard were previously whipped by Theon, which Theon referred to as having a little skin off their back, which sounds like a potential allusion to skin changing. Theon calls Drennan a fool, making him like Jingle Bell and Cresson with Patch's Fool's Helm, and of Drennan's mortal wound it says, his throat had been opened ear to ear, meaning that he got a red smile like so many others. And finally, Drennan wears a ragged tunic, tying him into the straw man scarecrow symbolism like the cat's paw assassin in the Night's Watch brothers. Because of all these matches, Asha is again placed in the role of tree woman receiving a sacrifice, with the sacrifice here being a ragged fool with a red smile and a slipped skin. Asha kills him after seducing him. He's actually caught with his pants around his ankles, so it's a great example of sex and swordplay. Theon summarizes thusly. I'd say Drennan was pulling down his breeches to stick it in the woman when she stuck it in him. This speaks of mutual destruction and of the moon avenging herself by killing the sun. A moment later, Theon hears that Asha is among the missing, and we get this bit of his inner monologue. Asha, he had suspected her from the moment he saw that second cup. I should have known better than to trust that one. She's as unnatural as Asha. Even their names sound alike. That makes for a good excuse to bring Asha Greyjoy into the mix, whose name does indeed sound like Asha and like Ashai. That bit about Theon thinking that Asha and Asha are unnatural is actually referring to an earlier scene from A Clash of Kings, when Theon first returns to the Iron Islands and fails to recognize his sister Asha, leading up to her punking him big time at the dinner feast in a very memorable scene. He could feel the flush creeping up his cheeks. I'm a man with a man's hungers. What sort of unnatural creature are you? Only a shy maid. Asha's hand darted out under the table to give his cock a squeeze. Theon nearly jumped from his chair. What? You don't want me to steer you into port, brother? Marriage is not for you, Theon decided. When I rule, I believe I will pack you off to the Silent Sisters. He lurched to his feet and strode off unsteadily to find his father. Like a lot of Theon and Asha scenes, this seems like a foreshadowing of Theon's castration. But setting that aside, poor choice of words perhaps, there are three lines of symbolism that I want to focus on here. The unnatural woman, the silent sister, and of course, the shy maid. The unnatural descriptor is not only applied to Asha and Asha, but also to Sansa in a scene that we'll quote next episode, and to Kat, who thinks to herself during her downward spiral that Bran and Rickon must surely think me a cold and unnatural mother. This would seem to refer to the transformed undead moon maiden figure, the Nissa, Nissa Reborn archetype, or simply to the idea of moons and trees that undergo alchemical weddings and magical childbirths as being freaky, unnatural mothers. It's not a huge thing, but since it's applied to Sansa, Kat, Asha, and Asha, I thought I'd mention it. Next, the Silent Sister remark. We know that the Silent Sister is a component of the Nissa, Nissa Tree Woman archetype because Lady Stoneheart is called the Silent Sister. The Silent Sisters are called the Handmaidens of the Stranger. In other words, they are psychopomp figures, or at least they play a role in that process, helping the living transition into the realm of the dead. They are, of course, silent, like the Weirwoods. So you can see how all of that fits Stoneheart, as well as the general notion of a Weirwood death goddess. Thus, even though Asha Greyjoy is obviously quite outspoken, this comment by Theon serves as a clever way to show that Asha is playing into the Silent Sister line of symbolism. As for the shy maid remark, obviously it's sarcastic. Asha is no more shy than she is silent. I made the joke earlier about Melisandre being an Ashai maiden or being made in a shy, but actually it's not my joke. This is from A Dance with Dragons. Check this out. 
Snow wrenched his arm away. I think not. You do not know this creature. Rattleshirt could wash his hands a hundred times a day and he'd still have blood beneath his nails. He'd be more like to rape and murder Arya than to save her. No, if this is what you'd seen in your fires, my lady, you must have ashes in your eyes. If he tries to leave Castle Black without my leave, I'll take his head off myself. Melisandre from Ashai has ashes in her eyes. It seems like a bit of wordplay to prompt us to think about the fact that Ashai sounds like ashes. And what's great about this quote is that John says, if this is what you have seen in your fires, then Mel must have ashes in her eye. But the this that John is referring to is Mance Raider's plan to use the wildling spearwives, including Rowan, to rescue who they think is Arya from Winterfell. In fact, the paragraph preceding this one mentions Melisandre, Ygritte, Arya, and the spearwives, which will include Rowan. Those are all Nissa Nissa moon maidens, leading up to the ashes in your eyes wordplay. Ygritte, by the way, is a shy maiden too. After John gives Ygritte his Lord's kiss, down in the cave near the wall, it says, afterward, she was almost shy, or as shy as Ygritte ever got. Again, the point of labeling the Nissa Nissa figures as shy maidens is to imply them as ash tree maidens, as weirwood women. It's also done to imply the Nissa Nissa figure as a specifically burning tree woman, because, as I'm about to show you, Martin appears to have a habit of describing flames as shy maids. A woman made of fire, in other words. That's the shy maiden archetype. Melisandre is a living incarnation of this idea, and all of the shy maiden symbolism will come back to her. Many of the weirwood goddess figures manifest the shy maiden symbolism or bear witness to the phenomena, but it will kind of all be bouncing off of Melisandre's symbols. Check out this quote from Asha Greyjoy's A Dance with Dragons chapter titled The Sacrifice, and this comes right as the Reloris and Stannis' army are set to burn a few people at the stake that they caught eating human flesh. And in case you're wondering, yes, I do think Martin is making an eating steak, burning at the stake cannibalism joke here. Lord of Light! Accept this sacrifice. A hundred voices echoed. Sir Corlys lit the first pyre with the torch, then thrust it into the wood at the base of the second. A few wisps of smoke began to rise. The captives began to cough. The first flames appeared, shy as maidens, darting and dancing from log to leg. In moments, both the stakes were engulfed in fire. The shy fire maidens sound a lot like the trademark fiery dancers here. And that makes sense, because the fiery dancers seem to overlap or to be the same as the fiery sorcerers that also appear in the flames of the Lightbringer bonfires. Melisandre, the Ashai maiden, is a fiery sorcerer, and although she doesn't dance herself, you will recall the candle flames dancing in her eyes as Cresson took his final breath. So she does have that symbolism too. I probably don't need to point this out, but obviously there is human sacrifice via fire going on in this scene with the Reloris burning people at the stake. And that compares well with Danny's alchemical bonfire, which also had human sacrifice, as well as the fiery dancers and fiery sorcerers. Finally, Asha herself is threatened several times as being the next one that they'll burn at the stake, further implying a symbolic correlation between the shy maiden flames in the Rolorist pyre and Asha the shy maiden who they want to put in the Rolorist pyre. Speaking of Lightbringer bonfires and fiery dancers, do you recall that Lightbringer bonfire that Jon Snow and Corn Half Hand whip up the night before they are captured by the wildlings? That was the one where the tree that had been dead a long time seemed to live again in the fire as fiery dancers woke within each stick of wood to whirl and spin in their glowing gowns of yellow, red, and orange. Very poetic, I know, but the point is that at the very beginning of the chapter, earlier that night, we saw the flames in that same fire appearing as shy maidens and take note of the fact that it is the first flames which are the Shy Maidens, just as it was in the last scene with the Rolorists. When Corin Halfhand told him to find some brush for a fire, John knew their end was near. It will be good to feel warm again, if only for a little while, he told himself, while he hacked bare branches from the trunk of a dead tree. Ghost sat on his haunches watching, silent as ever. Will he howl for me when I'm dead? As Bran's wolf howled when he fell, John wondered. Will Shaggy Dog howl far off in Winterfell, and Grey Wind and Nymeria, wherever they might be? The moon was rising behind one mountain, and the sun sinking behind another, 
as John struck sparks from flint and dagger, until finally a wisp of smoke appeared. Corin came and stood over him, as the first flame rose up, flickering from the shavings of bark and dead dry pine needles. As shy as a maid on her wedding night, the big ranger said in a soft voice, and near as fair. Sometimes a man forgets how pretty a fire can be. What we are really talking about is an ashy tree maiden on her alchemical wedding night, when she will swallow the fire of the solar king from Ashai and become a burning tree. You will notice that Ghost is prominently featured as John hacks at the dead tree, preparing it to be burned and to live again in the flames. Ghost is a silent watcher, just like the weirwoods he resembles. Then John thinks about his death in the next line, even as the sun sets in the background. The moon is rising, though, just as the shy maiden flame is. And indeed, the moon is kind of the original shy fire maiden. And of course, all of the weirwood women here are also moon maidens. The whole scene is good nature mythology, in fact. Solar John thinks about his death and hacks apart dead trees for firewood as the sun sets. And as the moon rises, so too does our fiery, dancing, shy moon maiden. There's a great quote from a Jamie chapter of A Storm of Swords, which equates the constellation called the Moon Maid with our shy maiden archetype, while also casting her as a tree nymph associated with stars. Jamie lay on his back afterward, staring at the night sky, trying not to feel the pain that snaked up his right arm every time he moved it. The night was strangely beautiful. The moon was a graceful crescent, and it seemed as though he had never seen so many stars. The king's crown was at the zenith, and he could see the stallion rearing, and there the swan, the moon maid, shy as ever, was half hidden behind a pine tree. How can such a night be beautiful? he asked himself. Why would the stars want to look down on such as me? Jamie, Brienne whispered, so faintly, he thought he was dreaming it. Jamie, what are you doing? Dying, he whispered back. Jamie is a fallen solar character, beaten up by the bloody mummers in this scene and forcibly amputated in a previous one. Even without the bonfire, this scene still correlates to the Ground Zero Lightbringer bonfire in the sense that we have a dying sun figure laid out on the ground, while the crescent moon above adds to the sacrifice symbolism and may be meant as a call out to Brand's vision of human sacrifice through the eyes of the heart tree, a chapter which featured the crescent moon being like the blade of a knife and, of course, a curved sacrificial sickle used to kill the victim in front of the heart tree. But as the sun sets, the moon maid rises, and so we get the appearance of the moon maid constellation as Jamie is dying. She's posing as the shy maiden, peeking out from behind a tree, just like a tree nymph. That's a pretty nice one. Yet another connection between the moon maiden and the idea of a tree woman, a starry tree woman to boot. Brienne is a moon maiden, of course, and here she's whispering to Jamie to live, whispering so faintly that he thought he was dreaming the voice. A moment later, a bloody mummer comes over to tell Brienne to shut her bloody mouth, giving her a bit of weirwood stigmata symbolism as she dream whispers to the dying solar figure, trying to will him back to life. Finally, Brienne herself happens to be a moon maiden who is actually both shy and a maiden. In A Feast for Crows, she reflects that, even as a girl she had been shy, long years of scorn had only made her shyer. She's the shyest maiden. Anyway, this scene finds a companion with one involving Jamie's brother Tyrion while he's on a Rhoynish riverboat called the Shy Maid. That's right, the Shy Maid. That would be Yandri and Yasilla's riverboat that young Griff, a.k.a. Fagon Blackfire, was hiding out on, the one they sailed down the Rhoyne with Tyrion on board in A Dance with Dragons. That's already a great moon parallel for the Shy Maid. She's hiding dragon cargo, and that's referring to both Fagon Blackfire and theoretical secret Targaryen, Tyrion Rivers. In any case, it's just one line, but Tyrion is dozing off while sleeping on the roof of the Shy Maid, and we get this. A full moon floated above the mast. It is following me down river, watching me like some great eye. Oh, hey, look there, the moon is an eye. That reminds us of all the stuff with Bloodraven and the Nightfort moon and Odin. But the moon can also be seen as a face, and often is, and here the moon floats above the mast of the Shy Maid. The mast of the ship is like the tree part of the boat, as we've seen many times, and the moon here is acting kind of like the head, 
almost as if it were a big stick figure. It's very like the shy moon maid constellation being half hidden behind a tree. The shy maid archetype seems to involve both tree and moon, as we've seen. And since the moon is called an eye here, you could also interpret the mast of the shy maid and the moon eye to imply trees with eyes, which is, of course, a thing in A Song of Ice and Fire. Popping back over to Asha the Wildling, she has a scene that matches the last three that we just looked at, and that comes in A Clash of Kings as she hides in the Winterfell crypts with Bran, Rickon, Hodor, Jojen, and Mira. Bran heard fingers fumbling at leather, followed by the sound of steel on flint. Then again, a spark flew, caught. Osha blew softly. A long, pale flame awoke, stretching upward like a girl on her toes. Osha's face floated above it. She touched the flame with the head of a torch. Bran had to squint as the pitch began to burn, filling the world with orange glare. The light woke Rickon, who sat up yawning. When the shadows moved, it looked for an instant as if the dead were rising as well. Lyanna and Brandon, Lord Rickard Stark their father, Lord Edwile his father, Lord Willem and his brother Artos the Implacable, Lord Donna and Lord Beren and Lord Rodwell, one-eyed Lord Jonal, Lord Bath and Lord Brandon and Lord Cregan who had fought the Dragon Knight. Okay, in the last scene, the mast of the shy maid boat was like the body, and the moon its head, and here we get something very similar. Asha's face floats above like the moon, and the long, pale flame girl on her toes acts as the fiery body under her floating head. Take a picture, everyone. That's our Ashai maiden, the lady of the burning ash tree. She's a moon figure, a living flame, and an ash tree all in one. She may be a shy maiden, but you'll notice that she's filling the world with orange glare. The fiery weirwood woman does that by lighting up in fiery dragon childbirth and by facilitating the rebirth of Azor High, the ember in the ashes waiting to spark the great conflagration that we hear so much of. For example, the shy maid first flame in John and Corrin's bonfire eventually led to the big fire where the tree that had been dead a long time seemed to live again which we take as a symbol of Azor Ahai, the reborn undead greenseer, the fire starter. Returning to the scene in the crypts, we find that the dead are rising as Asha the Moon Maiden kindles her light in the darkness and makes the shadows move. This quote is talking about the statues of the Kings of Winter and Kings in the North, which are shifting in the light of the torch and appearing to rise. This is the green zombie theory again. When Asha appears as the fiery moon maiden, who is also a burning tree woman, she fills the world with glare and causes the dead to rise. But not just any dead. The Stark dead work very well as stand-ins for the last hero and his twelve dead companions. In particular, there are thirteen Starks listed here, as we mentioned in the Green Zombie series. So this is probably last hero math, if anything is. In fact, check out some of those names of the Stark dead. One-eyed Lord John Stark. Hmm, very interesting. Lord Donner, like Donner the Flying Reindeer, whose name means thunder and spelled the same way. And right after him, Lord Baron, perhaps to remind us of Beric Dondarian, the Bearer of Thunder. Lord Barth has a nickname which isn't mentioned here, Barth Blacksword. The fact that he is Lord Barth and not King Barth means that he lived in the last 300 years after Aegon's conquest, when the kings in the north became simply the Lords of Winterfell, and that means that he must have wielded the same Valyrian steel ice that Ned does which the Starks have supposedly had for at least 400 years. That means the Black Sword nickname is referring to Ned's ice, and this just goes to show that I am right to call these smoke-dark Valyrian steel swords Black Swords. It's close enough, guy that emailed me about that one time. I'm just kidding. Anyway, these are the type of guys you want to fight the others. One-eyed thunder people with black swords. The children of the Shy Maiden. In other words, think of this scene in the Stark Crypts as parallel to the idea of Night's Watch brothers being resurrected to swear their oaths inside a weirwood grove, with fiery Asha as the weirwood and the thirteen shifting stark shadows as the last hero in his twelve. Needless to say, it's highly suggestive that Jon Snow once played the role of a dead spirit emerging from one of these crypts and has reoccurring dreams of the stark dead waking from their slumber. Now when Melisandre is like a light blooming in the darkness beneath Storm's End, and its soon-to-be-burned weirwood tree, she gives birth to shadows with burning hearts, which, as we mentioned earlier, seem to parallel the Night's Watch. 
That too is basically the same thing that happens here in the crypts. A moon maiden lights up in the darkness, filling the world with orange glare this time, and then we see symbols of the Night's Watch being reborn as shadows, which would be the Stark Dead. Now, if Melisandre helps to facilitate the resurrection and rebirth of John, the new last hero, then we will have pretty much come full circle. And in fact, there's a foreshadowing of that very thing in A Dance with Dragons in that weird scene where Ghost comes to Mel's beckon and then won't come back to John. I can show you. Melisandre draped one slender arm over Ghost and the direwolf licked her face. The Lord of Light in his wisdom made us male and female, two parts of a greater whole. In our joining, there is power. Power to make life. Power to make light. Power to cast shadows. Shadows. The world seemed darker when he said it. Every man who walks the earth casts a shadow on the world. Some are thin and weak, others long and dark. You should look behind you, Lord Snow. The moon has kissed you and etched your shadow upon the ice, twenty feet tall. John glanced over his shoulder. The shadow was there, just as she had said, etched in moonlight against the wall. Mel is speaking of making a shadow baby with John, but when it speaks of John's shadow upon the ice and etched against the wall, it seems more like a foreshadowing of John's dead body being stored in the ice cells, as is foreshadowed elsewhere. Mel is talking about having sex with John, but the moonlight kissing John to cast his shadow as a giant sounds more like a metaphorical description of a moon woman like Melisandre giving John's corpse the kiss of life, as Thoros does to Beric, and thereby raising John's shadow as the new last hero, which is kind of like casting his shadow as a giant. This is also the scene where John notices that Ghost's eyes shine like Melisandre's when they catch the light a certain way, and Mel even drapes her arm around Ghost as she speaks here, further emphasizing the similarity between Mel and the weirwood colored wolf. So she speaks of her and John joining to cast shadows, but what will actually happen is that John and Ghost will join together to make a shadow, which will be reborn John, or Ghost John, I guess we should say. Man and wolf wed for life, as Verimir's teacher Hagon says, and Ghost did get there first. Sorry, Melisandre. Mel, however, will almost certainly play a role in the process, a role which we've been defining this entire episode, the role of the Shy Maiden, the burning tree woman who gives birth to Azora High Reborn. It may be that Mel will play something of a midwife role to the rebirth of RLJ Zora High. There's one other time that Asha Greyjoy calls herself a Shy Maid, and it actually has more to say about Winterfell and Greenseers. We're going to talk Theon now for a minute, but he'll be interacting with Weirwood Maidens in every scene. This first one is from A Clash of Kings, when Asha visits Theon during his short-lived reign as Lord of Winterfell. Asha snorted back a laugh. <laughs> this Sir Roderick may well feel the same manly need. Did you think of that? You are blood of my blood, Theon, whatever else you may be. For the sake of the mother who bore us both, return to Deepwood Mott with me. Put Winterfell to the torch and fall back while you still can. No, Theon adjusted his crown. I took this castle, and I mean to hold it. His sister looked at him a long time. Then hold it you shall, she said, for the rest of your life. She sighed. I say it tastes like folly, but what would a shy maid know of such things? At the door, she gave him one last mocking smile. You ought to know, that's the ugliest crown I've ever laid eyes on. Did you make it yourself? Winterfell is already a stone tree and a labyrinth, as we've seen, so setting it on fire would make it a burning tree labyrinth. Of course Asha the Shy Maid thinks that's a great idea. Theon is choosing to be stuck in this stone tree labyrinth, however. He always wanted to be a Stark, as Lady Barbary Dustin observes. The Grey King is a man associated with living inside stone trees, stone weirwood ribs to be exact, and as I mentioned, Theon transforms into a Grey King character after his stay at Chateau Ramsay. You can clearly see this in the description of him in A Dance with Dragons at Ramsay's wedding before the Winterfell Heart Tree. Theon wore black and gold, his cloak pinned to his shoulder by a crude iron kraken that a smith in Barrowton had hammered together for him. But under the hood, his hair was white and thin, and his flesh had an old man's greyish undertone. A stark at last, he thought. The Grey King had grey flesh and lived to be a thousand years and seven, 
and Theon, his descendant, has become an old man with gray flesh. Like I said, that's pretty clear. His black iron kraken was hammered together in Barrowton, home of the possible grave of Garth the Green, who may have also been known as the Barrow King. The Barrow King is a dead Garth symbol, a Winter King figure, as is the Grey King and, of course, the King of Winter, so this is all pretty consistent. Grey King's beard was as gray as a winter sea, just as gray old man Theon is a Stark at last in Winterfell, one of the ghosts in Winterfell, as he says. What we are seeing here is a clear conflation of the Grey King and the idea of being the Lord of Winterfell, with Theon becoming a Stark by virtue of his Grey King-like gray flesh. And of course, earlier, Theon tried to play the Lord of Winterfell. There's another description of Theon as the Grey King when Asha sees him in the snowstorm outside Winterfell, after Theon escaped with Jane Poole. The old man. No one would ever think him comely. She had seen scarecrows with more flesh. His face was a skull with skin. His hair bone white and filthy. Theon the Grey King now has scarecrow symbolism, such as the Night's Watch or the King of Winter has. So he's definitely sounding like an undead skin changer or green seer Night's Watch figure. As it happens, there is also a lot of symbolism to suggest Theon being sacrificed to a heart tree. It's suggested in A Dance with Dragons, when Rowan, the red-headed spearwife, and her fellow spearwives catch Theon praying to the heart tree and contemplating his sins. They pull a knife on Theon, and despairingly he says to go ahead and kill him. Rowan herself promises Theon a nice quick death. Again, this is in front of a heart tree, and Theon actually pictures his blood soaking into the ground to feed the heart tree in that moment. I swear, I don't make this stuff up. It's all right there in the book. Once again, it's the same pattern. A burning ash tree woman is set to sacrifice a certain type of figure in front of a heart tree. According to our theory, the Grey King was an undead greenseer who was indeed sacrificed to a weirwood tree in order to become an immortal greenseer zombie. And that's exactly what Theon is showing us. Well, the first part at least. It's doubtful Theon will become an immortal zombie, but who knows. I probably should mention that Theon contains the root word Theo, which means God, such as in the words theocracy or atheist. There is something godly about Theon, so perhaps a stunted form of immortality shall be his after all. All I have to say is that if zombie Theon rules the Iron Islands for a thousand years and seven after the story, you heard it here first. Rowan also later threatens to rip Theon's tongue out, and Theon says in that same conversation that there is blood on his hands, giving Theon a good bit of weirwood stigmata symbolism that might also foreshadow his being sacrificed to a heart tree. Asha dubs Theon the Prince of Fools, so if he's sacrificed, he will line up with all these sacrificed fools as well. There's a more symbolic foreshadowing of this that takes place at Winterfell during Theon's short reign there. Theon has a nightmare, the one about the Feast of the Dead, actually, with dead Robert and Ned and pale Stark wraiths in the background, and finally bleeding Rob and Grey Wind storming through the doors with eyes burning. Theon wakes in fright and drinks some wine to steady himself, meaning he has a red mouth. The wine brings no solace, however, and so he goes to the inner ward and starts loosing arrows at the archery butts until his fingers bleed. Then we get this quote, and recall that the broken tower at Winterfell is broken because it was struck by lightning, and therefore it can be used to represent a burning tree. Behind him, the broken tower stood, its summit as jagged as a crown, where fire had collapsed the upper stories long ago. As the sun moved, the shadow of the tower moved as well gradually lengthening, a black arm reaching out for Theon Greyjoy. By the time the sun touched the wall, he was in its grasp. If I hang the girl, the Northmen will attack at once, he thought as he loosed a shaft. If I do not hang her, they will know my threats are empty. He knocked another arrow to his bow. There is no way out. None. I thought that was a pretty nice one. The black shadow arm of the crowned and lightning-blasted tower reaching for Theon is pretty sweet, and of course it grasps him when the sun is about to set, because the Grey King and the other Winter King figures are like dead solar kings who get turned into shadows by the Weirwood Tree. The talk of hanging poor Beth Cassell, horrific in terms of the plot, is nevertheless a good bit of symbolism. House Cassell's sigil has ten white wolves on a grey field, so Beth is something of a white wolf girl, 
a parallel to Ghost, the direwolf who looks like a weirwood. If Theon were to hang such a girl, it would mean his own death as well, he realizes. And that's in keeping with all the mutual death, solar sacrifice slash tree sacrifice symbolism that we have seen. Now, I cannot avoid a very small Winds of Winter spoiler here. Don't run. Don't panic. I'm not going to quote anything. I'm not going to give away anything major. So I really don't think this is the type of thing where you need to stick your fingers in your ears. It's a ridiculously small spoiler. And it's from the very first spoiler chapter that he ever released several years ago at this point. But, fair warning. This is going to last about 30 seconds. Anyways, basically... The foreshadowing of Theon being sacrificed to a heart tree continues, and there is some hinting that it could be at the heart tree growing on a wooded island a few miles from Winterfell at a frozen lake where Stannis' army is encamped. Okay, wave goodbye to Theon. What's he doing in our weirwood goddess essay anyway, right? Let's finish this section with Asha Greyjoy, who has a bit of symbolism in the well-traveled Wayward Bride chapter that applies here. Our beloved author pretty much dedicated this entire chapter to finding different ways to personify trees as human. We had Northmen dressed as trees, trees that hated the ironborn in their wooden hearts, trees whispering to one another in some secret language, Asha's recollection of stories about that time when the Greenseers turned the trees to warriors, which is one of the better clues in favor of my theory about resurrected skin changer Night's Watch brothers. But perhaps best of all is this bit. The trees were huge and dark, somehow threatening. Their limbs wove through one another and creaked with every breath of wind, and the higher branches scratched at the face of the moon. There's another great line about the trees that's a lot like this, which, upon further review, has a new tidbit for us. West first, Asher insisted. West until the sun comes up, then north. She turned to Rolf the dwarf and Rogon Rustbeard, her best riders. Scout ahead and make sure our way is clear. I want no surprises when we reach the shore. If you come on wolves, ride back to me with word. If we must, promised Rogon through his huge red beard. After the scouts had vanished into the trees, the rest of the Ironborn resumed their march, but the going was slow. The trees hid the moon and stars from them, and the forest floor beneath their feet was black and treacherous. A dwarf and a guy with red hair and beard vanish into the trees, upon which time the trees hide the moon and stars. That sounds a lot like Azor Ahai as the fiery bearded guy and the dwarf as a child of the forest also involved in the sacrifice somehow, because both went into the trees. There's also a line to match John's scene in the Weirwood Grove of Nine here. The sun was sinking behind the tall pines of the wolf's wood. As Asha climbed the wooden steps to the bedchamber that had once been Gulbard Glover's, she had drunk too much wine, and her head was pounding. The sun sank behind the wolf's wood. Again, we are given an echo of Skull and Hattie, the wolves that ate the sun and moon. The wolf's wood is a place that still has weirwoods growing wild, it should be noted, so it's definitely a good union of Ghost swallowing Sun King John and the idea of the trees swallowing the sun. At the moment when the sun sinks, Asha, the shy moon maiden's head, is pounding. She drank too much wine, but what she actually had is too much king's blood. This is simply another instance of the weirwood moon maiden symbolically drinking the blood of a sacrificed solar person, as we've seen many times today. Now, most of the trees in this chapter are out to get Asha. She's not on Team Tree, in other words. She represents the moon pulled down by the green seers. That's why the trees are out to get her and why she has all the drowning, sacrificed moon symbolism. But at the end of the chapter, she nearly gets sacrificed to a tree and is then treated like a tree in the process, which seems like a depiction of Asha as a moon maiden turned falling moon meteor who strikes the tree, sets it on fire, and merges with it. So she's fighting her last foe of the battle, a bald and bearded northman, and... His axe was shivering her shield, cracking the wood on the downswing, tearing off long, pale splinters when he wrenched it back. Soon, she would have only a tangle of kindling on her arm. She backed away and shook free of the ruined shield, then backed away some more and danced left and right and left again to avoid the down-rushing axe. All right, so her shield is being chopped like a tree, pale splinters flying, and then it's described as kindling to make us think of burning wood, and tangled to make us think of tree roots. She's dancing like our fiery dancers, and then... 
Her back came up hard against a tree, and she could dance no more. The wolf raised the axe above his head to split her head in two. Asher tried to slip to her right, but her feet were tangled in some roots, trapping her. She twisted, lost her footing, and the axe head crunched against her temple with a scream of steel on steel. The world went red and black and red again. Pain crackled up her leg like lightning, and far away she heard the Northman say, You bloody cunt, as he lifted up his axe for the blow that would finish her. This one is pretty vivid. She's back hard against the tree, her feet are tangled in the roots, trapping her, and then she's struck by an axe, which makes pain crackle up her leg like lightning as the world goes red and black and red again. The bloody cunt language, as we've noticed before, is a call out to the bloody birthing bed and the symbolic moon blood that came along with the moon meteors. Asha is kindling, being axe chopped like a tree and struck by lightning, all of which makes her the tree, but she is also kind of sacrificed to the tree and trapped in the roots like a green seer would be. So like I said, she seems to be playing the role of tree and sacrifice, kind of like Kat or Masha Heddle, and the meaning of this could be that Nissa Nissa was at first a woman who was sacrificed to the trees as part of a ceremony to give it a face. This would then allow Azora High to wed the tree and enter it, and thus he'd be wedding Nissa Nissa. I really try not to get too specific with these kinds of details at the risk of overinterpreting and generating tinfoil. I prefer to focus on getting the main ideas and symbols right and presenting a range of options, leaving the rest for everyone else to interpret as they will. You can kind of see what's going on here, though. The Moon Maiden sacrifice and the tree struck by lightning ideas are happening at the same time and place. As Asha loses consciousness, we get the last line of the chapter, which now hits like a ton of bricks. She dreamt of red hearts burning, and a black stag in a golden wood with flames streaming from his antlers. So struck by lightning, the Ash Ah Moon Maiden dreams of burning hearts and a flaming black stag in a golden wood. The fiery black stag is inside the wood, giving it a burning red heart and setting everything on fire. And this happens only as the ash tree moon maiden is sacrificed and struck with lightning. Of course, this is not just a burning stag symbol that appears. It's Stannis, second-rate Azor High Reborn impersonator, complete with flaming sword. That's pretty much the whole sequence right there. Now, before we leave this scene, there's a little bonus weirwood maiden, a fearsome young ironborn woman known only as Hagen's daughter. Behind her, Grimtongue shouted, Nine, and damn you all! Hagen's daughter burst naked from beneath the trees with two wolves at her heels. Asher wrenched loose a throwing axe and sent it flying end over end to take one of them in the back. When he fell, Hagen's daughter stumbled to her knees, snatched up his sword, stabbed the second man, then rose again, smeared with blood and mud, her long red hair unbound, and plunged into the fight. Naked and bloody, much like Melisandre giving birth, kissed by fire red hair like so many others, and wielding a sword like Nissa Nissa reborn, the vengeful tree spirit, she bursts from beneath the trees, and you know what that means. You do, right? Okay, sweet. All right, we're all done with Shy Maidens for now. And for those of you who have stuck with us this far, there's one final spectacular Weirwood Stigmata, just for you. Very near a seventh skin. This final section is brought to you by the generous support of Sir Cosmo of House Astor, High Priest of the Church of Starry Wisdom, whose house words are, We Walk at Dawn. A little book we call A Dance with Dragons begins with a prologue from the perspective of one Vermeer Sixkins, a naughty skin changer if there ever was one. And by the way, we do want you as our Patreon patron, but it's also a good idea to throw Radio Westeros a couple of bucks, because then you'll get access to their patron-only episode, which is all about this Vermeer prologue. And it's actually one of their best episodes that they've ever done. I really liked it, so I recommend it highly. In any case, as you might guess, this is going to come down to the end of the prologue when Vermeer attempts to leap into the skin of Thistle the Spearwife, the body snatching. Obviously, since Vermeer is the skin changer attempting to invade someone else, he'll be playing the role of the comet, 
or more precisely, we can say that his invading spirit is like the comet, and Thistle is set up to be the tree woman. But there's one passage from the beginning that we can't skip before we get to the end, because we have some symbols that we recognize well. A dead or dying fire, and an ember in the ashes. Dun dun dun. That was when he noticed that his fire had gone out. Only a grey and black tangle of charred wood remained, with a few embers glowing in the ashes. There's still smoke. It just needs wood. Gritting his teeth against the pain, Varamir crept to the pile of broken branches Thistle had gathered before she went off hunting, and tossed a few sticks onto the ashes. Catch, he croaked. Burn! He blew upon the embers and said a wordless prayer to the nameless gods of wood and hill and field. Consider what Varamir is doing here. He's praying to the old gods to help him start a fire with the ember in the ashes. Even an ember in the ashes can still ignite a great blaze, as the saying goes, but it needs help from the old gods, I guess. So check out the clever wordplay in the very next paragraph. The gods gave no answer. After a while, the smoke ceased to rise as well. Already, the little hut was growing colder. Varamir had no flint, no tinder, no dry kindling. He would never get this fire burning again, not by himself. Thistle, he called out, his voice hoarse and edged with pain. Thistle! He would never get the fire burning by himself, no. He needs dry kindling and thistle. But Thistle's name is practically synonymous with dry kindling already, and indeed, she's about to play the role of the ash tree woman. Varamir will be trying to become the ember in her ashes, and together, they will make a fairly horrific version of the burning tree. Near the beginning of this prologue, she's described as a spearwife, tough as an old root, warty, windburnt, and wrinkled. The things that jump out to us here are, of course, the idea of her being burnt, or her being like an old root. Varamir's voice yields up a couple of good clues here. It's horse, and this gives him a bit of horse symbolism, like many of the people playing the Skin Changer Comet role. For example, Martin used the horse voice description on Cresson in his final moments as well. Varamir's voice is also edged with pain, making it sound sword-like. Here I simply have to recommend an outstanding essay on Westeros.org called The Killing Word, A Reexamination of the Prologue. I keep mentioning this person called Ravenous Reader who's been serving up some great observations and catches to the podcast lately, and this essay is one of hers, so check it out. It has to do with the link between songs and spells and magic words and implements of killing like knives and swords. It goes pretty well with the end of this essay because the Game of Thrones prologue that she's looking at and this A Dance with Dragons prologue with Varamir are linked in many ways. I'm back at the scene with Varamir. He leaves the hut and, seeing a weirwood tree walks over to it and finds himself a weirwood crutch. I would take this as a symbol of a green seer using a weirwood to spirit walk, or perhaps more simply as a sign to indicate that Vermeer is playing the symbolic role of a green seer when he invades Thistle, who's acting like the tree. The snow had stopped falling, but the wind was rising, filling the air with crystal, slashing at his face as he struggled through the drifts, the wound in his side opening and closing again. His breath made a ragged white cloud. When he reached the weirwood tree, he found a fallen branch just long enough to use as a crutch. Leaning heavily upon it, he staggered toward the nearest hut. Perhaps the villagers had forgotten something when they fled. A sack of apples, some dried meat, anything to keep him alive until Thistle returned. He was almost there when his crutch snapped beneath his weight and his legs went out from under him. How long he sprawled there with his blood reddening the snow, Varamir could not have said. Ah, oh, wouldn't you know it? His crutch breaks. They just don't make weirwood crutches like they used to. This gives him a weirwood version of the broken branch symbolism of a dead green seer or a corrupted green seer. He falls to the snow, with his legs being mentioned as having went out from under him, reminding us of another crippled skin changer that we know well, Brandon Stark. Then we see Varamir's blood reddening the snow, the familiar solar blood sacrifice on the snow symbol that we examined last time at the Grove of Nine and elsewhere, and this helps to confirm Varamir as a sacrificed solar character or comet character. Varamir also has a wound in his side, perhaps a call out to Christ's spear wound in the side, and Odin's very similar impalement on Yggdrasil. A couple of lines later, as Varamir thinks about dying, 
he recalls Hagen's words, which serve to reinforce the sacrificed skin changer theme. South of the wall, the kneelers hunt us down and butcher us like pigs. Vermeer sees the weirwood watching him and weighing him, as if he had been sacrificed in front of the tree and is now standing in final judgment. He briefly loses consciousness and dreams of one of his deaths inside his animals. And then, as he's on the brink of death, and symbolically he is dead, having been sacrificed in front of the tree, we get a depiction of his spirit leaving his body and going into the tree, which means going into thistle. Varamir woke suddenly, violently, his whole body shaking. Get up! A voice was screaming. Get up, we have to go! There are hundreds of them! The snow had covered him with a stiff white blanket, so cold. When he tried to move, he found that his hand was frozen to the ground. He left some skin behind when he tore it loose. Get up! She screamed again. They're coming! Thistle had returned to him. She had him by the shoulders and was shaking him, shouting in his face. Varamir could smell her breath and feel the warmth of it upon cheeks gone numb and cold. Now, he thought... Do it now, or die. He summoned all the strength still in him, leapt out of his own skin, and forced himself inside her. Thistle arched her back and screamed. I'll just cut in here to point out that Thistle is arching like a crescent moon, or like the arch of a doorway. She's also emitting what would seem to be the Nissa Nissa cry as the invading spirit enters her like Lightbringer entering Nissa Nissa. Next, we get a vivid depiction of the merging and the weirwood transformation. Abomination. Was that her, or him, or Hagen? He never knew. His old flesh fell back into the snowdrift as her fingers loosened. The spearwife twisted violently, shrieking. His shadow cat used to fight him wildly, and the snow bear had gone half mad for a time, snapping at trees and rocks and empty air. But this was worse. Get out! Get out! He heard her own mouth shouting. Her body staggered, fell, and rose again. Her hands flailed. Her legs jerked this way and that in some grotesque dance as his spirit and her own fought for the flesh. She sucked down a mouth of frigid air, and Varamir had half a heartbeat to glory in the taste of it and the strength of his young body. Before her teeth snapped together and filled his mouth with blood, she raised her hands to his face. He tried to push them down again, but the hands would not obey, and she was clawing at his eyes. Abomination, he remembered, drowning in blood and pain and madness. When he tried to scream, she spat their tongue out. All right, a lot just happened. She's staggering and going mad and doing a grotesque dance. Thermir was staggering too with the weird crutch, and all this mad dancing is Odin's shamanic dancing, and also a nod to all the fiery dancers that we keep seeing at Lightbringer forging parties, which notoriously go on and on until the break of dawn. The line about her twisting violently is notable, as it's a match for the twisted weirwood at the night fort. Then she bites their tongue, filling their mouth with blood, and eventually spitting it out after clawing out their eyes. I'm sorry to keep quoting all these super violent scenes, but Odin's symbolism, and much of mythology in general, is very violent. In any case, the symbolism is the thing here, and we can't ask for a more vivid depiction of a woman being invaded by a dying skin changer's spirit and then turning into some kind of freaking weirwood death goddess. Just to make things even more clear, behold the very next paragraph. The white world turned and fell away. For a moment, it was as if he were inside the weirwood gazing out through carved red eyes as a dying man twitched feebly on the ground, and a madwoman danced blind and bloody underneath the moon, weeping red tears and ripping at her clothes. First, Varamir goes inside a woman and turns her into a weirwood. Then he goes into the weirwood and regards himself. The dancing and madness are re-emphasized, and the red bloody tears are mentioned here specifically. Thistle dances underneath the moon, which kind of reminds me of that scene where the moon is like the head on top of the shy maid's mast, or when Osha's head floats above the flame that is like a girl on her toes. So thistle would be the body, and then the moon above her would be like the head. Beyond that, the moon simply adds to the extra witchy vibe to this haunting scene. Now, I'm not going to pull the quote, but 
Vermeer's spirit ends its trip on the cold wind in the body of one of his wolves, and of course it's the one named One-Eye. That's right, he becomes a one-eyed man-wolf. Just to make sure you know we are talking about Odin stuff when we see green seers and skin changers merging with trees and undergoing death transformations. Now, did you notice how it said the white world fell away? In the Asha scene, where she is quasi-sacrificed before the tree and struck with a lightning-like blow, it said, the world went red and black and red again. I mean, maybe it's coincidence, but it seems like something traumatic is happening to the world in these moments. And when Vermeer finally finds himself inside of one eye, it says, half the world was dark. And when they watch the advance of the army of the dead a moment later, it says, below, the world had turned to ice. Osha's torch like a lady on her toes fills the world with an orange glare. Something along the same lines happens twice when Bran skin changes Hodor climbing the hill to Bloodraven's cave. First it says, Bran felt the world slide sideways as the big stable boys spun violently around. And then a moment later, the world moved dizzily around him. I mean, it's not breaking news that something very bad happened to pretty much the whole world, but the point is that it happens when the sacrificed green seer enters the tree. I would say that this is a corroboration of my hypothesis, that Azor High entering the Weirwood Net was an important part of the long night chain of events. There's a lot more going on in this prologue, specifically having to do with the others and all things related to ice magic. Thistle ends her life as a blue-eyed corpse, with her frozen blood like ten pink knives hanging from her fingers, and the weirwood itself in that scene is a pale shadow armored in ice, which is language that evokes the others and Jon Snow both. Varamir has a death transformation experience inside a weirwood maiden, and then experiences something like plunging through the surface of an icy lake, which could be symbolic of crossing the wall and battling the others, or perhaps even turning into an other armored in ice. We really can't go there just yet because we haven't even begun to talk about the others. But we shall return to solve the mysteries of ice, have no fear. First, we need to finish with this weirwood compendium, and we've got a couple more episodes planned in the series. So, stay tuned, and thanks for being with us today. Come visit us at luciformeanslightbringer.com, and please subscribe to our new YouTube channel. Right now we just have our podcasts up there, but we're working on our first video, and you definitely won't want to miss that. We hope you'll consider supporting us on Patreon, where we have some prestigious new positions available. Thanks to all of our patrons, and to those of you who contribute at the t-shirt level, I have received the shirts, and we'll be working on shipping those out in the next few weeks. I have a few more left, so if you're not a patron and you'd like to grab one, check out our Patreon campaign. Until next time.